I call this meeting to order and I turn it over to our media people to acknowledge with the traditional lands, please. The land upon which we work, live, and sustain ourselves is the ancestral and treaty lands of the Michizagig and Nishinaabe, also known today as the Mississaugas of the Credit, the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land. We also recognize the rich pre-contact history and relationships, which include the Anishinaabe and the Ongwe Hongwe. Since European contact, this land continues to be home to indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. As responsible community members, we value the diversity, dignity, and worth of all people. Colonialism displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples of their ancestral land. And continues to deny their basic human rights, dignities, and freedoms. We are committed to learning true history to reconcile, make reparations, and fulfill our treaty obligations to the original peoples and our collective responsibilities to the lands, water, animals, and each other for future generations. Thank you. Uh, let's get ready. So, uh, Um, so let's get ready uh, to start. Before we do, we need to have approval of the agenda. So, as uh, Benjamin, do I have you put it on the floor? Yes. Uh, tr uh, Trustee uh, Sad Paul, uh, uh, seconded. Uh, any comments or questions on the agenda before we approve it? Seeing none, okay. So, all those in favor of the agenda, so be it. Uh, we're now um, moving ahead. Uh, any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none, we'll move on to approval of the budget mi minutes. So um, I'll have uh, Trustee Cole to put it on the floor and uh, Trustee uh, Benjamin to second it. Do we have any comments or questions around the previous budget uh, development committee meeting of May 27th? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion so passed. Or sorry, so uh, in favor of the minutes. Okay. Um, so now we have uh, um, we have staff reports. We have three staff reports um, to be uh, coming to, to us, and the first uh, report will be from our public consultation survey, uh, which will be an oral report uh, by our. Lynn Hollinstead in our research department, right? Yes, the slide deck going up. Yes, the slide deck. 6.2. Uh, 6.1. 6.1. Great, thank you. And through you, Trustee McBond. Uh, good evening. The slide deck, if you want. I wasn't sent it. So. Oh, where is? Waiting for the report. Huh? Is it on in the yeah. report? It's not I'm sending it. Mark, Mark is coming to you right now. Okay, perfect. On its way. Hot <laughs> off the press, right? Last person got a vote in there. Spotlight on Kimberly Jones. Mm -hmm. Spot, great spotlight on Kim. <laughs> I forgot her last name. West Credit. <laughs> so I'm with your guys. Punishment. Remember. 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 <laughs> Karen McDonald and I went to Kimberly Jones School for flower plant sales <laughs> and i went so and i came with the way with baby yeah you didn't buy any plants the just cinnamon, look, cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> oh. okay we have carla joining us thank you so are we ready here we go there we go Good evening. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you the results from our recent budget consultation survey. Can we Slide, please. 
This survey was conducted just recently between May 21st and May 29th, and we had 468 respondents complete the survey. Next slide, please. As you can see, our largest response group was the staff at 46%. Next was students at 26%, and then parents and guardians at 22%. The remaining 5% consisted of fuel residents, school council members, community, community organization members, faith leaders, et cetera. The survey was designed around 10 priority areas. Select these. These priorities were determined based on the key priorities from the Responsive Education Program, or REP, allocations, and from the funding pillars. These descriptions shown on this slide and the maps were provided in the survey to support participants' understanding. The 10 priority areas were literacy, STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and math, supporting vulnerable students, French language instruction, mental health, student readiness, operations in school facilities, indigenous education, student transportation, and learning resources. The survey consisted of five questions related to these priorities and the budget. Next slide, please. The first question asked participants to rank the 10 budget priorities to indicate where they felt we should focus most of the spending. This graphic shows how the participants ranked each of these priorities. Based on respondents' input, the top four priorities, for example, are literacy, supporting vulnerable students, STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and mental health. The following four graphs represent the questions asked about each of the multi-year strategic plan or sorry, priority or both areas. Next slide, please. This question asked about student achievement. Here you see within student achievement, the top four spending priority areas are literacy, STEM, supporting vulnerable students, and learning resources. Next slide. This question asks about the prior priority area of equity and inclusion. The top identified spending priorities are supporting vulnerable students, Human Rights and Inclusion and Learning Resources. Slide. This slide shows the results for safety and well-being. Mm -hmm. The top priorities are mental health and supporting vulnerable students. And the last slide in this purple four is about community engagement. The top priorities within the context of community engagement are supporting vulnerable students and uh, uh, mental health, excuse me. And last slide. Finally, the participants indicated some alternatives within the please describe box for these last four questions. The responses provided generally fell within these themes. <clears throat> Community engagement, equity and inclusion, facilities and resources, <laughs> safety and well-being, staffing and staff supports, and student support and inclusion. Thank you, and we'll take any questions at this time. Okay, thank you very much for the report, Liz. Um, so, do we have any? Uh, well, let's put it on the floor first. So, uh, Trustee Bailey, uh, put that on the floor. Uh, Trustee uh, uh, Seth, or Seth Paul Joel, or can we put that uh, seconded? Okay, now that it's on the floor, uh, who would like to ask some questions? No questions? Well, I'll ask one. I got the report just emailed me to me, and I'll just look at it. So, you know, we had the 10 areas, and then they're ranking them. How is that? You know, I didn't take the survey, so I'm not, I'm just curious how this survey, would they have to rank them 1 to 10, or they just had to pick the most uh, important one? How does, how does that say the first? table on on slide six 
how does that um, how is that work inputted? Yeah, so so the tool offers the ability to sort. So there was they were listed and and then the participants sorted the the list into the order that they preferred from top to bottom. And then if you wish to know how it was calculated, each bar represents the total of the different rankings participants gave to the priority. So given that there were 10 priorities, so the highest score was 10 to 1 for the lowest ranking, divided by the highest possible ranking if all participants selected the priority as number one. Understood. So um, then when we're okay, so okay. So that means just trying to say uh, statistically, then what happens when you have, you know, say literacy is the number one. That means generally that rank the highest in all other ones, cumulative placement. And then second was supporting vulnerable students, STEM, mental health. Is it tough? And so that goes on for all of the, the other ones. For example, I'm looking at student achievement. So in, in this case, they were asked um, to select all that they um, thought were important. And, and so those, if we can go to there, for example. So 51% of the respondents selected literacy in this question. So you didn't have to pick all of them. Either. You could pick as many as you wanted. Oh, okay. Okay. Just trying to get my head around what does that mean from what the public is saying applies. Okay. Uh, and that would be the equity inclusion followed that same same one. Safety and well-being on slide nine followed the, the same thing. Community engagement uh, followed the same thing. Now you said there's some general um, areas of focus. Um, in the past, we used to get comments. So, you know, do you have like a, a, I'll say a word wall of some of these these comments with you? So can you go to the last slide, please? Uh, the the comments were um, reviewed, summarized into themes. Right. Um, and so these are the themes that the the comments fell within. Do you have like any specific lines that you know for each you know, to represent each one of those? Uh, so, for example, under facilities and <clears throat> resources, provide air conditioning, update technology resources, uh, library and gym resources, build field trips and outdoor learning, school security technology. So there's some repeating. That's a good list. Uh, what about the community engagement? Do you have Do you have this there? Or am I just asking? So I, I, there's some here. So community partnerships, uh, parents and uh, parents engagement, encouraging parent participation in school activities, support for multilingual um, equity and resources. Do you have any others for the any other categories? I, I'm just I curious. There's some examples. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not full so so uh, under curriculum and instruction. Arts and physical education, uh, back to basics, math support, comprehensive curriculum programs, art education, so to repeat, professional development, under staffing and support, increased staffing, uh, teacher support, so ensuring teachers are present in classrooms, reducing lab cancel classes, support for administrators, uh, hiring and training, support for educators. Good. Is there safety and well-being was another category, I see? Um, or student support and inclusion, whatever you have. So transition programs, special education, mental health, special ed. So it was still coming back to those categories, categories. that were in the priorities. Student well-being initiatives, enhanced learning opportunities, <laughs> free food and supplies to provide free food and supplies to support students' basic needs. Good. I think that's a little more fulsome rather than you know, just hearing that. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank okay. you for that. So any other questions? Um, yes, uh, Trustee Dohong. Thank you, Chair. To you. I was uh, just uh, looking at the respondents, 460 participants. 
those who call you see that number? Is it a representative? Uh, Compared to last year? Is oh, that... it, it is less. So we ran the survey late this year so that we have less opportunity to advertise. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, any further questions? Uh, Trustee Joe? Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Davies. Just was wondering, um, I've noticed that 46% of response were staff and 22% uh, were parents and 26 were students. Did we find a huge variance in the responses, like what the priorities were between those groups? So I did look at the first question and felt that it was not conclusive. So I didn't share that graph. I felt it was more confusing than helpful. That it really wasn't conclusive. What you're saying, if I understand the, the taking the first question and trying to slice it into those three, you know, people are answering, which is basically 90 plus percent of the stuff, you saw really no conclusive differences between right. staff. Uh, as students and parents. Okay. So, with the next questions, which is good. That's good. They all want uh, what number one was? I don't know. Literacy. Literacy. And number two, number three, STEM, which I love. Yeah. used to be an engineer. Mental, mental health, though, made it to number four. There we go. It's good to know. Good. Uh, any other questions? Yes, uh, Trustee Benjamin. Yeah, all these. Uh... Put you your mic on, and so people. So sorry. Yeah, mental health, uh, learning resources, literacy, and supporting vulnerable students also kept being repeated in almost every, uh, you know, the question. So I think that and mental health has to be sort of connected because vulnerable students definitely would be also that group that requires a lot of support. So that's, I think that's important for us to make note of. Thank you, uh, Trustee Benjamin. Uh, any other Trustee questions? Trustee Bowles on my turn. Sorry. Trustee uh, Bowles you actually raised hand there. I just see I've minimized this uh, report. So Trustee Cole, I'm oh, sorry. Trustee Cole, you have a question? Um, Can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I noticed that you said that they could pick off more than one response. Is that right? So for the uh, first question on, uh, I was on you know, page six, that was they ranked them all in order. But then after that, every other one was you picked what you felt were important. Okay, so that was more. my question. Yeah, if there was like a ranking system in place, Only like which one you felt was most important to least important, or if it was just random, <laughs> like what do you think is important? Okay. Yeah, so that was only the first one which ranked uh, literacy number one. It was for yeah. phone students number two, STEM, okay. and potential okay. health. Good. Uh, any other, any further questions, uh, Trustee Cole? No, that was all. I just wanted to see what was ranked and what wasn't. Ah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, seeing no more questions, I'll uh, put this to a vote. To all those in, sorry, no question. Uh, all those in, in receipt of this report, so carried. So we'll move on to the next item on the uh, agenda is the item 6.2, presentation of the business cases by senior leadership team. This is going to be a tag team event, I believe. So uh, who's going to start our fun and games of money? Uh, chair, so so I, I will start. So so if you look at that that uh, business case summary, which is attached to the business cases, that's that's the sort of sequence we will we will go through it going through the business cases. So I, I'll start with, with the legal and governance uh, subject. So there are two uh, business cases uh, from from that area. The first business case it's a number one zero eight four. So that's a request for an increase in the integrity commission budget. So for the current school year, for 23-24, the budget for the integrity commissioner is, is $25,000. So by February 2024, we have already spent that the budget. And so we had to add additional $25,000 uh, 
for, for this school year. So far, then, then going looking into the, the next school year, uh, as you probably aware, uh, that, that we are going through the stress code of conduct uh, is in the process of being reviewed. Uh, and, and the integrity commissioner will uh, provide an extensive input into, into that, that, that review. So as a result of that, the ask is an additional $75,000 to the, to the budget of the integrity commissioner for next school year for a combined $100,000 next school year for, for, for that review. I can respond to any question. Who's gonna, who's gonna, who's gonna go first? Okay, trustee the Mullen, please. So for this for this academic year, we budgeted twenty five thousand dollars and have moved on significant copy about that. How does this compare with previous years? Is there have we typically budgeted for twenty five thousand dollars per year? Is there a reason why we're four times higher than we would normally be in this line item? For you, uh, Jim McDonald. I believe that integrity commissioner started their work only last year or, or this year. There was no integrity commissioner before as we were uh, going through the supervision. So so it's, it's hard to compare. Uh, so the only comparison we have is this current school year. And and where we the budget is is close to fifty thousand dollars. Started with twenty-five and we added to additional twenty-five. So it's it's, it's close to fifty thousand for this year. I appreciate the response. I, I feel like I have a lot of questions and thoughts on it. I just am not really sure how to formulate it, but I appreciate the response on it. So, uh, all the money for the thoughts from my colleagues. <laughs> okay, Trustee Davies. Um, I'm under the impression that the Integrity Commissioner would release any reports to all trustee. Like, I haven't seen anything, I haven't heard anything, or does that just mean applying under the radar? Or? So through you, uh, Chair McDonald, I, 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 I can't respond to that. Okay, you can't. I'm sure the work that was done by the Deputy Commissioner. Uh, you know, and this is where, you know, the governance uh, officer was would be the one who has to be interfacing to that. Yeah. But you're right, there has not been one report brought to the board. But we don't know about any informal. And we haven't had a report by the integrity commissioner, where she's supposed to give an annual report <laughs> on the stuff she does. Right. That, when does that do? I, I was just sort of well, a question I would be asking the yeah. you know, legal governance person. Yeah. But in absence of that, <laughs> yeah, it's probably the last bit of questions that needs to be asked. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's a good point. Anyway, sorry, more questions? Uh, Trustee Alps? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would say so. Uh, I'm going to do my best not to mispronounce your name, but I believe our acting legal, acting legal counsel is Evie Chukwanewe, and uh, Mrs. Chukwanewe will be able to, I think, give us the answer regarding the timeline for the report from the Deputy Commissioner. Um, it's my understanding that most, if not all, of the uh, consultation that the Integrity Commissioner does. That would lead up to a report or an informal report or or just trustee consultation is private. Uh, they have some restriction with what they could share, but to the point you raised, well, I think it may be we, uh, I'm not a member of the committee, but maybe the committee asked uh, the question of our active legal counsel because I think they do have to provide us with some kind of receipt to say, here's how many hours was spent on whatever to justify XYZ. I think you. Hit a lot of the same questions we're all hitting that, uh, but she's supposed to provide an annual report that is uh, just says how many uh, formal reports, how many informal uh, reports have been done, and then you know what she's you know spent her time um, and so uh, that's I, 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 we'll find that out. We'll have a you know obviously we'll get that, but we won't be getting that tonight. Question on mine though, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so I just want to go through any of the questions here, uh, Trustee Bailey. Um, and then I'll get to you, Trustee Cole. Thank you, Chair. Um, Associate Director Gill, uh, does this increase account for the proposed changes to the abuse of inter 
Integrity Commissioner in Bill One in Bill Ninety Eight. <clears throat> So, uh, through you, Chair McDonald, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not sure. I don't have the details of the work done by the Deputy Commissioner this year. So, so uh, the ask is more based on that if we are looking at spending close to $50,000 this year, that uh, my understanding is that the Deputy Commissioner will be involved in the review of Trustee's Code of Conduct, and there is Supposed to be a significant amount of work that 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 the deputy commissioner will do on that, and that's why that additional fifty thousand dollars is requested based on that to total of hundred thousand dollars for next year. Okay, so just so that I understand what you're saying, the increase is based on um, the the past usage of this year right. nothing to do with um the proposed bill the changes to the bill thank you thank you uh now we'll go online uh, trustee cole i think that was an old hand sorry okay old hand um so um i'll just say i i'm $100,000 is a salary of someone, and that would mean we'd have an employee working here 100% of the time, and I'm a little leery of that. Um, so we'll leave that to what we decide later on in the budget case, but thank you very much. for uh, Any questions before we move on to the next case? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on. Yes. So through you, Chair, I'll now uh, talk about the business case 1085, and that business case is a request so to increase in, in, in the budget for external legal services. So uh, as a board, uh, we do uh, employ external law firms. We retain them for, 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 for various departments for, for particular needs of, of, of that, that area. What we have noticed is, is, is the, the, the last uh, two years, uh, and as well as this, this two year, there, there has been a significant increase in the human rights tribunal application that that we that we hired external legal counsel to respond, as well as uh, increase in the legal subject needed for special education, and 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 also uh, significant increase in the labor and employment matters, as well as real estate. So so based on all those additional uh, requests that 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 we get from various areas. Uh, the legal and governance, uh, they, they're asking that their budget be increased by a decimal $700,000 uh, based on uh, the expenditure that they are expecting this year, as well as uh, going forward into the next school year. So that the, the first stage for an additional $700,000 to increase the budget for the legal and governance, uh, their budget for the legal services. So I'm happy to respond to that. And just uh, if I understand correctly, that brings with in how in changes from this year that yes. brings it up to three million dollars on legal expense. expense. Close to that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any comments or questions? How has this been? This number been previously? Um, if if we go back. Uh, <clears throat> Number of years, I would say, even even before the, uh, before we went to the supervision, I think we were looking at close to 2.2, 2.3 million dollars on, on an average. Uh, and, and I think we, what we noticed is is is, is last uh, couple of years, uh, 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 the, the cases or the sport or the the substance where we need for external. Is going up. We are hearing more and more, as I, as I indicated in, in, in the presentation. There are more and more human rights tribunal applications that that we need to respond. I mean, those those do take quite a bit of time to for us to properly respond to those ones, and also the special education area, uh, as well as into employment and, and labor areas. So those are the areas where we see a significant increase in in, in the way uh, we need more subsidies of external. Help. Well, for their expertise as well as uh, us to, to respond properly. Okay, thank you. Any others before we move on to the next business case? Uh, oh, yes. oh, sorry, Trustee uh, Davis. Is there any logic to um, just hiring staff, but to like the legal like labor employment, just to have a legal employment lawyer on staff? 
through uh, Jane O'Donnell, you've had all various kind of experience. Uh, when the ministry uh, did the review, uh, one of their recommendations based on that, hey, we are spending over $2 million, why don't we hire an internal legal counsel? In my opinion, it has not reduced uh, over the cost. Uh, what has happened it is, is because people ask more, and then internal legal counsel gets involved in day-to-day -day legal issues rather than rather than us, us responding to the actual cases which we should do. So having additional more person, in my opinion, will not change uh, our external legal costs. Okay, through you, sir, could we just tell staff that's not what they're for? They're to help us with external issues, not internal issues? So, to the chair, uh, and the other factor I think is uh, having an individual does not have expertise in all areas. So that's the other thing we yeah. need is when we go out, it's mainly we go out based on the expertise that we need in, in different areas. So that's another reason. So there's only so much having internal covers that you can cover. Thank you. Uh, trustee Alex. Thank you. I think it's well going on on the committee. I'll okay. just add my comment for this. Uh, okay. It doesn't seem, in my opinion, uh, too outside of the ballpark of, of reasonable. Um, you know, it's like medicine. The specialists work in their specific field. And frankly, I, I wouldn't want a, a generalist working on something like specific real estate law um, or, or legal matters as it relates to issues of special ed. But um, Associate Director Desmond Hill was saying 2.2 to 2.4, seven years back, for supervision. Cost of goods has gone up. Time. I think it seems reasonable. Thank you. No, I, 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 I get, I get, get that. that all, all I'm seeing here in three years, Chair, is I'm seeing an increase in 90,000 for real estate mm -hmm. external. So, what was it before? And is that number now where we should have a, a real estate legal expert on staff? Do you want me to answer or you can answer? Or, or it's the same thing with uh, labor and employment. That's all. I'm just wondering if we're getting to the point where we should have one legal yes. uh, expert. Okay. To you, uh, to you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, we real estate is not, even though we're asking for additional $90,000, real estate is not one of the areas where our external expenditures are, 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 are significant, I would say that. Because as because as you know, in, in PO, we are not growing as we used to grow. So we are not purchasing as many sites with new schools and issues like that. So so uh, I'm not sure that uh, having an internal legal council focused on real estate will, will help us with that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before we go on to one 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 one? Okay. Yes. So through the chair, I will ask superintendent. Smith to uh, to now go through the the business case related to innovation and research. Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, with regards to business case one eleven eleven additional research staff. So the purpose for this business case is to enhance the capacity of the research and accountability team to meet increasing demands for system wide data analysis and program evaluation essential for improving student outcomes and tackling systemic racism and oppression. The current staffing levels are insufficient to manage the growing workload, which includes extensive surveys, program evaluations, and the development of a new Power BI dashboard for dynamic data reporting. The proposal includes expanding the team by adding a new full-time research coordinator and upgrading an office assistant to a research assistant, facilitating more effective data handling and project management. The requested amount is 127,306 for the total annual costs of the additional staffing and upgrades. Would you like me okay. to stop? Yeah, after each well, business. Yes, yes, please. We'll stop and we'll ask questions. Do I have any questions on, on this one? Um, I do. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Superintendent uh, Smith. Um, SDI, you know, I was around when that first got introduced and I really liked it at the time. But I also think that it doesn't really show need in a school anymore. Um, and is that what you're trying to do is find a better measurement of need in the school? Like maybe looking at other parameters rather than stats 
statistics, but maybe looking at absenteeism, looking at uh, you know move, uh, turnover, et cetera, to really find out what where the schools of need are. And thank you for the question and true to you, Chair. Um, the SVI is something that's being looked at and currently we have some consultation that is happening to review that. So that would be one of the tasks of the research department. And as you can imagine, that would be a very cumbersome role for them. And hence the reason why we're asking for an additional research coordinator to support with that type of work. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions or online, let's move on to business case 1114. Thank you. And this business case is for the Leading Education and Innovation Project, which we are currently at the symposium right now in Mississauga Secondary, so I apologize for not being there in person. Um, the purpose for this is funding for the Leading Education Innovation Project is to drive forward the innovation in education by supporting transformative practices that empower modern learners. This expansion aims to embed cutting edge anti-oppressive educational methodologies that significantly enhance student achievement while fostering global competencies. By investing in LEAP, we are committing to a progressive educational framework that also embeds, embeds STEAM that we heard about earlier, that not only adapts to the changing world, but also actively shapes learners who are equipped to navigate and influence their environments effectively. This initiative underscores our dedication to redefining educational excellence and ensuring that all students are prepared to excel in a globally connected society. So our need then is a significant plan for integrated technology and inquiry-based learning into teaching to build capacity amongst educators. Funding is aimed at supporting an increased demand for this work as we grew the number of projects from last year from 46 to 170 this year, plus an additional 50 for iPad LEAP projects as well, having to do with identity stories and in, in partnership with Apple. So these enhance student achievement, including innovative uses of artificial intelligence and STEM, enhancing direct engagements with students in transformative educational practices. Our requested amount here is 400,000 to accommodate the growth and scaling of this initiative. You can take any questions. Any questions? I don't see any questions, so uh, I guess we'll move on to 11.22. And 11.22 and 11.23 can go together. This is for the BYOD e resources, which is the Digital Human Library and Discovery Destiny Renewals. So the purpose for this business case is to significantly enhance the digital resource offerings of the library support services team, promoting inclusivity and accessibility in line with the latest educational strategies and the Peel District School Board's equity goals. Our need is the expansion of e-resources collection. This is necessary for students across the system to support diverse learning environments and the integration of universal design for learning UDL principles including within our virtual learning environments. The investment will renew and expand access to crucial digital resources like the Digital Human Library and Destiny Discover, ensuring resources are culturally relevant and supportive of both online and in-person learning modalities. The requested amount is a total of $450,000 for the enhancement and expansion of digital resources. Thank you. So that's uh, 11.22 and 11.23. Any questions or comments to that? Uh, I don't see any, so uh, we're going to move on to 11.31. And I think I'm deferring this one to uh, my colleague, Superintendent Scocato. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Smith, and through you, Chair McDonald, uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, we wanted to ensure that um, that we can continue to foster inclusive and equitable environments that are essential for students to be successful in their classrooms. Many students are required and need uh, assistive technology in order to be successful in their classrooms, um, and we would need the additional ed tech innovation resource teachers to meet the expectations outlined um, in the SIA claims and the SIA funding. 
funding. So um, as you know, and many of our trustees spend time at SEAC, um, making sure that students have access not only to the technology and software that they need, but the requisite training for them to use that technology as a tool um, is significant. So um, we are asking for an additional three ed tech resource teachers to meet the needs of the SIA claims and students with uh, with uh, disabilities. The total request is 359,559. Thank you, Superintendent Sakata. So any comments or questions on this one? Uh, I have one. So when we heard you present the budget funding, they changed the deductible. Is this in relation to that? See your claims on technology? Yeah, so just recently through you, Chair, Chair McDonald, just recently there was a shift in the SIA funding model that came down. Um, formerly, we had um, a deductible, an $800 deductible. Um, the ministry has removed that deductible from the <coughs> spending mechanism um, and <coughs> increased it to a $5,000. If we have $5,000 for a single claim, we get reimbursed for that. So we need to ensure that students are still getting access to the support that they need um, and there has been significant shifts in the SIA funding model. So you're asking for uh, three more people but are you asking for more money to cover the SIA shortfall? Uh, through you Chair McDonald, no we are not asking for additional funds to cover the SIA shortfall. Um, we feel that the money is best spent in ensuring that students who have the technology which will be able to fund um, know how to use it as a tool for equity of access um, for both learning and well-being. Thank you very much, Superintendent Sakato. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, we're going to move on to the next item, uh, 1107. So, Trudy, I believe the next uh, four business cases will be presented by Eri Logan. Okay. Uh, thank you, and uh, through you, Chair, uh, the following business cases will outline the ways in which we will continue to support deep and sustainable change um, through the various uh, work that's happening around Indigenous education, and as um, A.D. Gill just outlined, the next three uh, roles are specific to um, Indigenous education support, and I just want to um, highlight that these three positions will amount up to uh, $397,434. And uh, the three positions are as follows, and they really speak to our expected outcomes specific to continuing to support the implementation and monitoring of our obligations to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action and upholding rights and in Indigenous people as outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we want to support schools to ensure that our school improvement and equity planning goals align with the TRC and UNDRIP and continue to support schools and build capacity with establishing meaningful ways to embed Indigenous histories, contributions and ways of being into all areas of the curriculum. So the first position, um, which is 1128, Resource Teacher Pathways Transition and Dual Credits for Indigenous Students. Uh, this position, uh, we know that Indigenous students often face unique challenges and systemic barriers in accessing opportunities uh, in education. And the Peel District School Board has created space for Indigenous students to access post-secondary experiences while attaining the necessary credit to attain their OSSD. A dedicated resource teacher for Pathways, Transitions, and Dual Credit programs can ensure that Indigenous students receive the support they need to access, navigate through these challenges, and to access opportunities for higher ed education. Um, and it's an important way to continue the work of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit um, education across the board. And we know that there's an urgent need to increase in Indigenous student enrollment in both the Algoma LEAP program, the UTM program. Um, and we also know that for students in grade three, the reading assessments of Indigenous students, um, the data shows that they are prone to following below the provincial standard. And this trend is mirrored in grade six as well. 
So moreover, in grade nine, EQAO math, Indigenous students are approximately 1.5 times more likely to score below levels three and four. The academic gap persists into secondary education, and with Indigenous students being twice as likely to be deemed, according to EQAO, um, not as successful with regards to the way that the data falls in the OSSLT, um, additionally, disparities persist in grade 9 and 10, academic English and math, where Indigenous students often score below level 3 and 4. So the work um, is really necessary to ensure that we have um, someone with strengths and areas of expertise around pathways, transitions and dual credit for Indigenous students. I don't know if you'd like me to now go on to the um, instructional coach which is uh, business case 1107. Please do. OK, uh, so with this specific um, role. Uh, again, we know the challenges that um, PDSB uh, students face in terms of discrimination, specifically around um, focusing the way in which um, race and religion and intersecting identities um, specific to Indigenous students. And we know that this impacts academic outcomes. And so um, augmenting the staff of the Indigenous education team will enable the PDSB to better equip to be proactively ensuring that the learning environments will support students most excluded by systemic barriers to address the racism in, that we often see in practices, policies and procedures. <laughs> Um, these roles are projected for September 2024, and the aim is to address the need to build capacity for implementing the TRC and UNDRIP. And so that speaks to the instructional coach um, for Indigenous education K-12. And then the final um, uh, position again. Oh, sorry, that's the second position. So there's two actual positions with that role. My apologies. I don't know if there's any questions about those positions uh, no, well, that will no, support we'll take, Indigenous students. We'll take all these uh, four because there's four, three instructional coaches in the first uh, one. So yeah, we'll and those ones are specific to Indigenous um, education. And then the fourth one um, is with regards to our um, African, Black and Afro-Caribbean and um, instructional team. So I don't know if people want to ask questions specific to Indigenous education before I move on to the final. Uh, role, or I can roll right into the fourth one if that's preferred. Yeah, let's stop at the indigenous. Sorry, I didn't understand that um, the division there. So, um, do we have any questions around the indigenous uh, three items we went through? Okay, Trustee Alves. Thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, so I see they're titled as instructional coaches. Um, just for clarity, these are different than the graduation coaches, correct? Uh, yes, they okay. are. Okay, no, that was my only clarified question. Thank you. Yes. No, and thank you for the question. Okay, so I'm going to ask some questions. How many instructional coaches do we have in an Indigenous education right now? Well, we have teacher advisors already in the role, and these uh, coaches will now provide a different level of support um, around specifically supporting also the educators that are working with them. Currently, the advisors are working um, also with teachers, but very closely with the students. Um, but now we're moving into a coaching model, which provides a different type of support um, that we want to be able to enhance and support through this model. Oh, I, I, I'm not. Can you explain the difference between an advisor and a, a, a coach? And uh, logically, can we up, upgrade <laughs> an advisor to a coach, or you you need both? Is what you're saying? Uh, yes, I would say that we need both because of just the different types of areas of specific expertise that are being often provided. Um, but both, again, um, are often um, individuals who are from the community. Um, they are engaging in Indigenous ways of knowing and able to providing support, whether it's specifically directly to students through the advisory role or um, specifically supporting educators and building capacity within their own context, context so that we have support um, not just specific to um, an advisory capacity, individually working with students or groups of students, that we're also building the capacity of our educators across the system so that they have a better understanding of bringing our understandings of truth and uh, reconciliation and also UNDRIP broadly across the system. So, uh, so how many advisors do we have? And they, they're paid. They're not volunteers, is what you're saying. 
Can yes, no, members? these positions are all uh, paid and they are all, all part of our Indigenous education team. And how many advisors do we have? I am just looking through that. I'm apologies, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that we have four um, advisors. Okay. But I will double check and clarify. No, thank you for uh, for all that. Uh, Trustee Alps, you have a question? No, Chair, you, you asked the question. I was okay, thank you. thank you. Online, I have Trustee Cole. I think you answered half my question. Uh, I was going to ask, is there a set number of advisors? that we need to have and is it based on how many indigenous students that we have per year or how does that change year by year yes and i would say there's not necessarily a set number that's established um the team began with a particular number again i don't have the history i apologize because i'm speaking on behalf of um superintendent hart but in terms of we established a particular number and as we've grown and particularly around the development of our indigenous education center and land-based learning um that work has expanded and grown and as we continue to do that um we're also adding um the necessary staff to be able to support that and we also have seen through the work that's happening uh, specifically in the center an increase in our um, Indigenous education uh, students who are actually um, also um, uh, identifying as Indigenous. And so we know that this is um, the work that we are doing is having a great impact uh, because we know that families and students are uh, becoming more and more engaged to the work that we're doing around Indigenous education. So this is in, in general for the general uh, school population. This is for Indigenous students themselves or for the general population about Indigenous education? And it's it's both um, because we have our, again, our Indigenous advisors and our coaches who are working specifically with students, but we also have the broad based piece where they're also working with uh, students broadly so that we have schools that will come to the center and also learn about Indigenous education and learning about Indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and so we have schools that will come. And so it's not just for um, non, sorry, not just for Indigenous students, it's also for non-Indigenous students as well. So it's a building capacity model, particularly through the coaches in terms of how they're working with educators to also be able to understand uh, the way that they can bring aspects and elements appropriate, appropriately through into our schools and classrooms around Indigenous education. So going back to what uh, Trustee McDonald asked, I, I'm just not clear on the on the difference between the two. There's educators and then there's advisors. What's the there's, main difference between the two? Yeah, there's there's instructional coaches and there's also student advisors. Yeah, and well, so sorry, what was the main difference between the two? Do they have a different educational background or? Um, I would say that they don't necessarily have a different educational background. It's just the way in which they're working um, in the system, whether they're working very closely and directly with students um, and building capacity around the students directly and also working with families and the coaches that have more of an instructional role in terms of supporting not only working with uh, the students themselves, but they're also working with uh, educators across the system to bring Indigenous education more broadly. Okay, I'll stop asking there. <laughs> um, uh, one last question. I don't think it's oh, sorry. Okay, Trustee Normal. No, no, you, no, you, no, you jump in. I'll finish this off. Um, yeah, thank you for this presentation, uh, Andy Logan. Um, I'm wondering because I, I do know that we have had some uh, some of our um, our coaches within the last year or two who I think had anticipated being in their roles for more of a longer term. And I think we saw that that role sort of finish up maybe earlier than they had been anticipating. I'm wondering if this is something that we're looking at for a one year period. Is it a, an ongoing period? What is the intention in terms of duration for this role? Um, for this particular role, and I believe for the roles that we're engaging in um, this year, um, and perhaps you can uh, jump in, uh, AD uh, Gill, is for one year renewable. Okay, so just that, and through you, Chair, so we would expect then that we would have 
would these be educators uh, from within our system that we would be expecting to apply for these positions to come out of schools, for example, to apply for these roles and then potentially go back to their schools after potentially after being in school for a year? Like how how would that be in practice? And for these particular roles that we have the opportunity to um, hire either internally or externally. Um, and we're looking for people who have a particular skill and background um, with a particular educational capacity. So they may come out for uh, a year, but it's one year renewable. And so we have the opportunity to renew the role provided that we have um, the ability to do so um, in terms of our um, you know, fiscal um, elements. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Trustee Joel. Thank you. Thank you through the chair and uh, A.D. Logan. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I was just wondering, uh, do we have uh, a number of students who will be benefiting from these coaches and advisors? Uh, absolutely. So, so these are again predominantly our, our our students who identify as indigenous who are um, obviously benefiting from uh, the work of the coaches that we have in addition to already the team of advisors. Um, but in terms of the, the benefiting, we know that students across the entire system, um, they don't necessarily have to uh, identify as Indigenous. We know that part of our commitment to the TRC and also the way in which we want to engage in our commitment to uh, UNDRIP around ensuring that Indigenous education, Indigenous ways of knowing um, are things that are not just specific to Indigenous Indigenous students. So it's a benefit for all of our students. Thank you. Uh, so the question was uh, if we have a number, how many? I think how he's many, asking how, how, yes, how many Indigenous, uh, I guess it would be identified students in our board? Yes, I can get that information for you. I don't have that in front of me at the moment, but I can get that for you. Thank you. No other questions? So I'm going to ask a, a, a probably not appropriate question, but of the three items here, which you think provides the most impact to the Indigenous community of our students? And I would say um, I would really prefer to ask that question of one of our um, Indigenous education folks, particularly um, Nicole Reynolds, who I feel would be a better person to be able to answer that question if there was a choice. But we know that these positions are all uh, necessary positions um, that are that we are able to um, have to fund and support um, the students who identify um, as Indigenous, because we know that we have a commitment here in the Peel District School Board, and there's an also commitment uh, with the province of Ontario to ensure that uh, we allocate funds and have funds available to uh, support Indigenous students, and also through that, um, en engage in a support around um, Indigenous education and specifically support for families. Uh, thank you, Associate uh, and, uh, Director uh, Logan. I, if you could get that res that response, because you said you have. Mm -hmm. have someone who could give that if you could have that email to us tonight that'd be appreciated absolutely thank you i have another one trustee uh, davies yes I, I was under the understanding that a certain um, grant for student needs uh falls under specialty of indigenous education if we don't use it we don't get it and i was just wondering if these funds sort of fell under that good question so to you, uh, Chair Donald, uh, yes, that is true. Uh, there is an Indigenous grant uh, that uh, that we can only use to, to support Indigenous grants. And would this qualify? These asks qualify? Yes, they will. Qualify. And do they fall under the number that the grant? To, to Chair, yes, I, I believe we have enough funds in, in that grant to, to support these three businesses. So, so this may be that, cha that changes in the whole discussion. I, I think so. I, I honestly think so. So this may be something where it really doesn't cost us anything. It's if we don't spend it, we don't get it. So therefore, we should spend it. Is it on book? Okay, so, so it is. It is on book. Yes. So it is on book. So if you don't use it, it stays within within that book. Uh, and then, then, but but at some point, I think the Mister will look at it. People ask me this much grant. Are you actually using it? Uh, starting, uh, I will say next school year, the ministry is really focused on 
school so those to use the funds they were given in that school year, not to continue to defer those funds in for future years. Oh, so, okay, so, you know this stuff better than me. So you're you're saying that this uh, let's say three hundred ninety thousand dollars, or almost uh, four hundred thousand dollars, is should be already enveloped, and, and but we're just not spending it, so we wouldn't be increasing our costs for more money not coming in. Is that what I'm understanding? Um, through chair, uh, so the the grant then to just grant. Uh, with the way the ministry changed the formula, uh, we can't use it for a lot of things that we were using it before. Therefore, uh, these particular positions would, could fall under it uh, without adding cost. And if we don't use the grant, it will move forward to the next year, but we can only use it for the same specific purpose. Good question. I appreciate that. Interesting. And Davis. Okay, I think we can move on to our uh, next. No, sorry, sorry. Trustee Kamali, sorry. <laughs> sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, just to just to build on uh, Trustee Davies' question, then um, before we move ahead, just while we're on this particular topic, are there additional business cases that would fall under that same spending umbrella that would also be in uh, envelope uh, enveloped for indigenous spending? That like I, I'm just curious what the overall spend is that we may have that is being requested tonight. Like, are all of these questions sort of moot if we have cases that fall within the full budget that we have? So, or, or are we being asked, you know what I mean? If there's um, cases that amount to a fuller total than what we already have enveloped here, we'd have to make additional decisions yeah. on top of that. That's my question. So, uh, to Chair McDonald, there's another business case which was presented through Innovation and Research, and that's business case uh, 1123. And in my understanding, that is source is meant to support our indigenous uh, education and the students. and. Uh, and, and definitely we are looking at uh, using the, if we get approved by, 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 by the board, definitely looking at uh, using those funds uh, coming out of the indigenous ground as well. So, okay, so not open. Yeah. that is a good question, follow up. So we have one, one, two, three. Yes, and then and we Eddie. have, all right. Oh, sorry, and I was just gonna say, I do have um, a couple of answers for you with regards to the number of uh, self-identified Indigenous students that we have. So I did receive that information and we have currently 937 students. So our right. envelope <laughs> funds as articulated will be able to support um, those students. And um, as I also mentioned that we um, continue to increase uh, the number of students who self-identify uh, because of the work that we've engaged in um, as a as a board. Awesome, uh, Associate Director Logan. Okay, I think we can move on to the, the next one, and that would be the instructional coach, the next instructional coach. Right, so this instructional coach is for the African, Black, and Afro-Caribbean, or ABC, uh, team, so our Black Student Success Strategy. Um, and so this role will continue to support effective implementation and monitoring of the actions of the We Rise Together 2.0 Black Student Success Strategy, which we know was launched back in January of 2022. Um, and this is a five-year plan, so um, concludes in 2027. Um, so we're in our second year of this the role of the coach is necessary to ensure focused and meaningful progress is made in the areas identified in terms of how we measure our progress. Um, additionally, the role of the ABC instructional coach will support students um, in ensuring that uh, we have our SEEP goals or school improvement and equity planning goals aligned with the strategy. So as a reminder, we have six specific focus areas that are part of the work that we do to ensure uh, Black student success. Um, we want to ensure that through the work of the coach, that they're supporting schools to build capacity with establishing meaningful Black Students Alliances, leadership opportunities, and um, a real focus in terms of supporting our graduation rates for Black students. This work will be accomplished through cross-departmental interdisciplinary coaching methodologies that allow instructional coaches to work with students to address the concerns, challenges that they have experiencing, as well as also building the capacity of our educators. They'll work collaboratively with the equity team members to provide leadership and strategic support to school teams to develop their equity goals and to deepen the repertoire of effective instructional strategies teachers are employing to dismantle anti-Black racism and to remain current within the PDSB policies and procedures. And one of the things I think I just want to draw our attention to is that our annual equity accountability report card um, 
that we know that we continue to um, have growth areas for uh, Black students because of the consistent and persistent disproportionate outcomes. Um, and uh, having an opportunity for an additional coach will also ensure that we have um, more focused uh, responses for educators to be able to support students as we have commitment for Black student success. So I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, Trustee Alves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering um, what the total number of our coaches are. For the oh. for, uh, yes. Yes, sorry. great. For, for the, um, I just want to get the header right for, sorry. So this is business case 1132, uh, inclusion, equity, and support. So how many total coaches do we have? Instructional coaches, that's the term. Instructional coaches for the department itself, or asking specifically coaches to the team. If there's coaches to the team, this is will be the only instructional coach for the ABC team. Understood. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Seeing no questions online. Okay. I think uh, I think we're done that one, and then we'll go on to. Uh, so Chair, sorry. I uh, just uh, one quick question. Um, in terms of uh, seeing that we are on the topic of talking about graduation coaches and so forth and everything like that, and um, I don't know if it's going to come up because uh, I'm seeing some. We have grad coach for our BSA students and uh, Indigenous students, but um, is there any anticipation of? Uh, Bringing on graduation coach for students in other uh, racial background or other background that is not doing as well because we one of the things that we as a board want to focus this year on is academics. And we have students that not identify as being black or indigenous, and we uh, feel that they might need some extra support in terms of grad coach. Um, is there any thought of at least bringing on um, a request to the coaches to support these other students that are struggling and need to be brought up to speed so that they also can can be able to uh, excel and uh, reach their full potential? Hey, thank you for the question. I don't know if uh, we still have um, Lynn with us because I know she knows these numbers inside out. Um, I do know that we have uh, some students who we know um, will struggle in other areas. However, when we look at historically and what has been happening for decades, it is Indigenous and it is Black students who have been historically and negatively impacted in terms of the outcomes for education. Um, and so, yes, there may be uh, students who are, are experiencing uh, difficulties or challenges. The numbers that we have um, in terms of proportion portions for Black and Indigenous students is significantly um, higher. And again, these are pervasive um, uh, historical elements that have been happening for, um, for decades. So that's one thing. And we also know that by virtue of these strategies and approaches that may be specific to um, Black and Indigenous students, that they are strategies that also support broadly a variety of students. One of the things that um, we heard when um, Lynn uh, provided the um, consultation uh, results, we heard that folks are very uh, interested in ensuring that we're supporting our vulnerable students. Um, that was interesting to hear that there are, uh, is, a, is, a, is a need um, and obviously um, uh, a need that we see um, recognized across the system, that we have vulnerable students that we want to be able to support. And so these strategies serve as approaches and methodologies that really service many of our students in addition to Black and Indigenous students. So just, just a follow-up, Chair, if you don't mind. Yes, so, um, you know, uh, myself, I understand what the data say, and I understand in terms of the uh, disproportional for Black and Indigenous students and what that has said over the years, because you were talking about a lived experience here. 
But at the same time, um, I believe that um, in the notion, no child left behind. So I believe that not taking away from what we're doing for our black and indigenous students, but it's also time that we as a board, if we're gonna focus on academics, we need to bring everybody up to par. We need to start looking at how we spread the wealth across the board. And basically, uh, instead of having our eyes and our heads set in one direction, start look, and see how best we can position every student to succeed. And that's what I'm that's what I'm looking for. And this is not, for instance, if you for instance, say for instance, if you're asking for uh one or two extra support in the to support the indigenous, I got no problem. Our black students uh needs the support, we know that. But what I'm talking about is it's time to look beyond that bring everybody up to board. So when we talk about no, no child left behind, then we, we can clearly say, okay, we are supporting our students because uh, if, if we continue, um, we had not, we're not taking nothing away from all black and Indigenous students, and we will continue to add because we realize that it's a priority. But at the same time, we want to see the other students that are struggling um, you know, um, especially those Caucasian students that are following, and I'm and I'm hearing it, I'm seeing it myself, and I'm taking calls from parents just now. I'm parents is texting me about the same thing, and I just responded here. Um, you know, when I when is my child is going to get some help? So that's what I'm talking about, Dr. Logan. Is that um, you know I would like to see something maybe, and, and, and maybe you know I'll take the whole body on at, at budget time and put a motion on the floor. Or maybe had two coaches that one in the north, one in the south, that can start helping some of these students move behind. So that's just a comment, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I, and I, if just, I, I just want to see, uh, you know, no student left behind. Thank you. Absolutely. And if I can just add to that, because absolutely, and you know, that is exactly the design of our equity action plan, uh, because that's what our actually action plan is looking at. It's looking at how our uh, various students faring, um, what are the strategies and approaches that are designed to support students of multiple identities, and how do we ensure that we um, work with classroom teachers, build capacity, um, use our um, the strengths and expertise of our equity resource teachers. We have equity resource teachers in every uh, family and schools to be working with um, the uh, entire area to be able to support um, students of a wide range of backgrounds. So uh, absolutely to you, um, Chair Green, we have many strategies and approaches. And perhaps one of the things that we can do is to support um, uh, our educators and also our families in understanding that although we have uh, created uh, specific uh, approaches for particular populations of students, how that is used across the system and how that helps many of our students in many different capacities. So thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, I think I have a follow-up question from Trustee Alves. Uh, I, I thank you, Chair, and through you, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think Trustee Green is articulating something that I have been uh, talking about for some time. Dr. Logan, I think you'll remember our conversation when we were discussing graduation rates and suspensions from late last year, when I had asked you about the graduation rates, I believe, for the Latin American community, the Latinx community, the Afro-Latin American community here at the PDSB, I think has been in decline for six years continuously, um, unfortunately. Uh, do, you, are you, do you know offhand if we have any graduation coaches for the Latin American, Afro-Latin American uh, Latinx community or, or what we have in place to, to bolster their support. Um, and I'll also just say, I think, you know, uh, Trustee Green, I'd, I'd very much like to work with you if the, the opportunities are to write that motion because uh, like you're saying, I think, I think the uh, need is there for, for many communities, but specifically I'd, I'd like to know what we have, if anything, right now in terms of coaches or resource to help bolster that trend. And um, through you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the question, Trustee Alves, um, for our graduation coaches and that we have, these are actually supported um, initially through the Ministry of Education um, by virtue of recognizing the way that the data has indicated specific needs um, to uh, Black and both Indigenous students. And um, when we're looking at 
the patterns that you have identified, um, that we know that through the various strategies that we are using for uh, Black students, when we're looking at when we want to speak specifically to progressive discipline and being culturally responsive, um, that we're also thinking about what are the needs of particular groups of students? And so what are the needs of our um, Latinx students? And how are they being um, integrated and supported by virtue of the various ways that we're looking at restorative practices? and the ways that we are working specifically to create um, climates in our schools that are more inclusive and reflect those particular individual students or groups of students. And so when we look at our numbers, and again, I'm, I don't believe that um, uh, Lynn Hollingshead is still on, our numbers of these particular students, and, and when we look at the broad ways in which we are supporting them um, at this particular time, um, we know that the work that we're doing around um, graduation, that we're working with our student success teachers, um, the ways in which our um, guidance teachers are specifically working with our vulner vulnerable students, um, and particularly our student success teachers, that we know that many of the specific strategies and approaches are making gains. So yes, um, I know that we did have a conversation uh, specifically to the Latinx students, and we are looking at ways in which those needs are being met. Um, and we're thinking about what are some of the culturally responsive approaches that are specific to those students um, that we need to see more reflected in the classroom. Thank you. And I guess my, my last follow-up would be, you know, when we spoke, we, we discussed, you know, in comparison to other communities at the board, and I don't have the report in front of me, but I believe at the time we saw they were, in comparison to every other community, uh, the lowest percentage in terms of graduation rate. Continually steep decline, I believe, with a short plateau. Do we have anything? I mean, it's budget time now, and looking, we're looking at uh, proposals. Do, do we, uh, are you able to tell us a bit about what's in place now or perhaps forthcoming to help with that community's graduation rates? Do we have any coaches for them? Um, we don't uh, have any coaches for them at this particular time, but as I mentioned, um, much of the work that we are specifically doing with our student success teachers, with our guidance counselors, and so forth, are designed to be specifically culturally responsive to many of our student populations. Um, there may not necessarily be the need for a specific uh, coach for Latinx students at this time by virtue of uh, our numbers by virtue of the, I know that when we are actually looking at the numbers, it appears in a particular way. Um, and again, it I think it would be a great opportunity to have um, perhaps a conversation with you um, and also Lynn Hollingshead so that we can understand how those numbers actually manifest themselves across the system so that we can actually look to see, you know, the numbers of students who are being impacted and the ways in which we are working with um, many of our teachers to be able to build their skills, their competencies, um, to be working with students that may be um, identified and be um, uh, deemed as uh, vulnerable in many different ways, so that they are working with families, so that they are working specifically with students, that they're looking at multiple ways to uh, support students around their needs, so that they are able to uh, meet those specific areas of growth and success. Um. The follow-up question to Trustee Alice before I go to Jill and uh, what is the cost of a graduation coach? If we were to have a business case in front of us for a graduation coach, what would that be? Do you know that or is that something you could bring back to us? Yes, it's something that I could definitely uh, bring back. What I would recommend, uh, Trustee Alves, is take that and yes. turn it into a motion at budget time yes. and uh, do it well researched so you can have the stats why it's needed and then we get the trustees to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm um, just looking at Trustee Green. It would be uh, something I'd very much like to work together on with Trustee Green. So I think we'll take it back. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Pomoli, and then I'll come to Trustee. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just following up on, on uh, the questions from my colleagues, uh, Trustee Green and Trustee Alice, and I really appreciate these questions that have come up. Uh, as we're having these conversations around coaches and resource teachers, um, I do understand that we have had a, a team of equity resource teachers in place uh, at the board who had been working to help uh, 
uh, address issues that students from uh, all kinds of perspectives and backgrounds across the board have been dealing with, but these positions had ended earlier than anticipated. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that that's the, the situation that has happened here, um, but this is something that has uh, come across our, come through our inboxes. Um, can you help us understand why that program may have ended earlier than expected? Um, or you know, did, did, did you find in your department that there was, uh, I don't know, I mean, when we're having questions and conversations about, about graduation coaches, about these resource teachers, and then we had uh, the set of equity resources teachers who I understand were doing great work, and this has been reported back from schools through, I know through all my wards and uh, throughout the community, um, but then the program ended early. Can you help us understand what change happened there with this team of equity resource teachers and, and why they're no longer being returned to their position and being returned instead to their schools? Uh, through you, Chair, and thank you for the question, um, uh, Trustee Pramoli. And I think uh, what um, I would be reflecting on would be reflecting similarly on a number of the different departments in the sense that we've had to look at our um, current budget, look at um, the fact that we are in a declining enrollment um, and looking at all of the different ways in which we need to um, reallocate and, and um, relook at our funds. And so um, some of those positions uh, were reduced. And um, as we know, that happened um, in many of our departments. So what you um, are referring to is a reflection of some of those reductions that we needed to make um, as a result of um, our current um, situation in terms of our uh, fiscal being fiscally responsible as a board. So, if it's okay for you, Chair, just to follow up, if we had one equity resource teacher that was addressing the needs of uh, one particular de demographic of students, and that equity resource teacher is no longer in place, who do we have to address the needs of those particular students who may have unique needs that are no longer being met? And when we look at our equity resource teachers, we have uh, very broad and general uh, resource teachers. Um, so yes, we did have some that are identity, identity specific based on, again, our data, based on our numbers, based on historical ways in which we're looking at um, ongoing and historical outcomes um, that we know has been happening for decades. And so we also have a series of equity resource teachers that are, are working with uh, vulnerable populations and working with um, some of our most marginalized students, and they have a broad range of skills and uh, particular understandings of communities, and they are working with educators to address those. Um, we are very fortunate that we have a very strong team, and they have been, and so I'm so pleased uh, to hear that, um, you know, they are having an impact and that you're hearing that they're having an impact. Um, but as we continue to work with our teams um, and we continue to uh, develop those broad skills, um, they are able to work take you know various approaches and and responses and work with um, students of all kinds of different backgrounds and that is actually the beauty of culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy um, i know that we didn't have an opportunity to have the equity department uh, do their presentation uh, some time ago uh, and uh, that it's going to be rescheduled um, but that's where you would have an opportunity to hear uh, the rich ways in which um, uh, the equity department through the, the um, small all but mighty staff um, work in uh, ways that they support a broad number of students um, and that it's not about always having um, resource teachers um, because we have diverse students. And also when we look at our student population, our student population, regardless of um, their specific identities, they're not a monolith. And so we take many of the different ways that we have um, strengths and skills and experiences to be able to support our students um, who are often uh, most marginalized. Okay, uh, thank you through your chair. I appreciate that. I do think the board, the board has done a lot of work to make sure that we are doing what we can to affirm identities. We are hearing back that we are now returning staff from positions where they have found, you know, families have found that we have had staff doing that work and now they're no longer in those roles and they're returning back to their schools. Um, so, um, I'd, I'd be interested to learn more about what the equity department is doing to make sure that we are affirming all students and that all students know that they belong in our schools. Um, and I can tell you, this is something that has 
pop up a number of times in my direction. I can only speak to, you know, things that have come my way, but, um, uh, Okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Chair. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our and that's our equity action plan. Okay. And uh, we look forward to having the opportunity to um, spend time with the trustees to uh, provide that overview of the equity department and the work that we're doing. We're looking forward to having that opportunity and identifying a new date. I think that's a good conversation for a curriculum committee. So you know, let's not try to uh, cross uh, conversations here. We're trying to look at business cases. We've only gone through about what, six, and we've got uh, a lot more. Uh, I've been part of the problem, uh, speaking too much. Uh, so I will ask trustees, really, if you have some important questions that are related to the business case and not outside that business case, please focus on that. Otherwise, we're going to be here to uh, way past 11. And I don't, I don't think all of us want to do it, but I also want you to have the information you need to do because we got to select which is our priorities. Uh, it's okay. Uh, so I think is that all the cases, uh, Associate Director of Open? Oh, yep. sorry, That's Trustee it. Bailey. That being said, okay, quick. Do you chair? Um, Associate. <clears throat> Sorry, a little bit. Sorry, very um, <laughs> Help clarify a little bit for me. I think I'm a little bit confused. Um, instructional coaches. That you said that this will be the first one, right? Uh, for um, for the ABC team, this Correct. one is an instructional coach that we have. That, yes, we have a new position. We have RTs, so resource teachers, and this will be uh, an instructional coach for uh, the ABC team. And uh, we've moved to having uh, an instructional coach just because we're looking at that skill set to build capacity and to be able to work um, with many different teachers so that they will also understand uh, the skills and the necessary um, approaches that, again, will be able to support. Yes, we know uh, our students that may identify um, as Black, but it also supports many students. So, so does that mean there's no instructional advisors for the ABC teams? Or are there there's, res there's resource teachers and there are instructional coaches. And then how many graduation coaches do they work with? And uh, well, the entire system, um, yes, they're part of the team, but there are seven graduation coaches. Okay, and so the instructional coaches will work only with the staff, not with the student? Uh, the instructional coaches will predominantly be working with uh, educators. Obviously, we have students that are going to be um, in their midst, um, but the instructional coaches will be supporting educators and building the capacity of, of educators, but along with working with students and so forth. Okay, thank you. Okay. It's a, different, uh, so it's a different role than the graduation coach, if that's what you're right. asking. Yes. Totally different. One's to teach our staff. That's no, because coach. in here it said it was talking about children. Yeah, yeah so, we're still working uh, with children as well. So um, we're going to move on to uh, 1106, the specialist high school major. Who's going to be presenting that? That will be uh, through you, uh, Chair. That will be Sukit and Hoppy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, and through you, Chair, uh, I do believe it was the counting on you that was going to be first. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes. That is the next one. Thank counting you. On you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So the counting on you, our COI resource teacher, has been a vital part of the counting on you program since February 5th, 2024. So just this year, earlier this year. With their support, the program continues to grow, adapt and serve the literacy and numeracy development of learners in grades 7 to 10. The counting on you resource teacher is responsible for building the teacher efficacy, the counting on you teacher efficacy and assist in the program coordinator in upholding program quality and integrity based on ministry and PDSB direct action. As the COI portfolio experienced a 53% growth from September 2022 to present, which is now approximately at 97 schools, and will continue to expand its offerings in the spring 2024 beyond, the resource teacher role remains integral to program success, and we are looking to provide more direct support for elementary students in order to continue meeting the demands of the growth and the program specialization observed in the Counting on You program since September 2022. 
The Quining on You coordinator will need the support of a resource teacher who will support and ensure that all program leads will receive ongoing and timely training, support and attention throughout the year, and with appropriate support in place for Counting on, to, counting on You teacher success, further Counting on You student success will follow. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next one. Sorry, I got the order out uh, to the 106. Uh, you know, we, we have the, the, the business case in front of us, so you just need to give us the highlights and why you think it's important for us on this. Thank you, Chair, and through you. So the Specialist High Skills Major, um, this is a program that, as you can see in the business case, we have been doing um, great things for many years. And so we've had um, an increase in terms of the number of programs that we are offering due to concerted effort. And the program needs have grown such that it's no longer going to be able, it currently has to, but due to the changes that have been mentioned previously in terms of our restructuring, it will be reduced to one, but we are looking to be able to continue that continued growth because we are now going up to 60 programs for September 2024, um, operating across 31 schools. And this is well beyond the capacity that can be held by just one um, current resource teacher. And so with that being the case, we are looking to be able to continue to provide that support. And we are, I would like to highlight the supports that are helping in terms of our students, in terms of their academic success, in terms of helping students um, in different pathways, particularly college and workplace pathways, as well as making sure that they are able to continue to support students to be able to find a variety of different areas in terms of the different ways that we are trying to support students as they're looking for pathways beyond post um, beyond secondary to post secondary opportunities. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, 1117 or sorry, I apologize. I'm jumping ahead. 1116. So for this position, this is for the experiential learning coordinator position. So the current experience, experiential learning coordinators workload is rather complex and has a number of different community, provides a lot of different supports in terms of um, bridging opportunities for students and um, engaging them with the different partners within the community. Um, we also, the, this particular portfolio also provides support for our recognition of experiential learning credits and through the community connected experiential learning and skill trades bursary and Kumba conference, We've seen a significant increase in the different ways that part, community partners are able to support our students through providing them with experiential learning opportunities to deepen and to strengthen their opportunities to be able to find success beyond the school. With that being said, we want to also extend that into the summer to be able to continue to provide opportunities and the experiential learning coordinator position is one that is vital to being able to do that because they are now able to work directly with students during the summer months where other staff are not able to do so. And without their, be, without their presence, we would be significantly impacted, negatively impacted without their presence to be able to continue that work um, throughout, the, throughout the summer where many students are looking for ongoing opportunities to further their, their educational experiential learning opportunities. And so we would like to be able to continue to offer this program to continue to build on the programming that we have. Um, there's been a significant increase in terms of the number of people, number of schools that have requested these programs um, that are offered through this coordinating position. And we'd like to be able to continue to support these students as they continue to support student success broadly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, we're going to move on to just, just one. Oh, sorry, the chair. Trustee, uh, sorry, Chair Green. Uh, Superintendent Poppy. Are these positions that you're requesting, are they going to be working from home or are they going to be in the building supporting students? Through you, Chair, all of these positions, they none of the positions they work from home, they work directly with our staff. And in instances of the resource teachers, they work directly with students. Okay, all right. As long as they're working directly, they're not working from home, they'll be in class, being building, supporting staff and students. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move. We're going to move on to some hazardous waste disposal services. In the interest of time, I'll just highlight a few key points. Yep. Let me know if you want me to stop after every uh, business case. Yeah, so you have about, uh, I have about five. six, five, five, uh, five. So yeah, if you could go through them very quickly, uh, you know, I know it's your time, it's our time, so uh, do the best to sell it in short time. Sure. Uh, business case 117 is regarding uh, health and safety and a hazardous waste disposal increase in costs, primarily due to keeping up with the inflationary increase of contracts. 
uh, in addition to increased number of uh, pickups uh, at sites. So when I say sites, that's the schools. This is the regulation that is required by um, uh, Ontario Regulation 347, waste management to remove hazardous waste within 90 days. We have 40 co-registered sites uh, for biological and chemical waste from science labs, oil from automotive shops, uh, shops and biohazard waste from student, uh, student needs. The board has access to five vendors, uh, and this is primarily to keep up with the inflationary costs of the contracts. So 119, the protective... Uh, 119 is again um, okay. uh, health and safety, and uh, this is reflective for the workplace personal protective equipment by, uh, by regulation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Section 25. Employers are required to provide PPE to workers. Uh, there have been significant increase in requests to ensure that the board fulfilled its obligation to protect workers. Um, most of the PPE that the PSB is required by, is required by educational assistance, supporting students with high risk and complex behaviors. Use of PPE is indicated in student safety plans. Uh, there is a compounding uh, authorizing costs uh, related to personal protective equipment. Some of this equipment uh, is there to uh, support staff uh, and protect them from injuries in the workplace, for instance, head protection, arm protection, groin protection, and then chest protection. Question. Yeah. 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 Very important to wear your PP at home, too, right? Don't just wear it at work. Anyway. If I can move on. Yes, um, please. Um, business case number 120. Uh, this is related to uh, our focus on automation. This proposal includes uh, the recently implemented software, which is Talent Link, satisfying Ministry Directive 25 by providing a centralized applicant tracking system and a file management system. Uh, data transferred directly from Ontario College of Teachers has been incorporated into Talent Link, so that's uh, uh, that is added to the cost. And then one of the additional benefits of using Talent Link is that it provides access to uh, a suite of and a range of other softwares that um, that will benefit us as we roll them out in phases. The amount requested in this business case also includes uh, costs uh, related to inflation. Great. Um, the following business case, which is um, increased budget for Indeed external job board, um, that is related to the board's initiative in outreach uh, as it relates to our hiring. One second, please. Uh, the the uh, this relates to upcoming expenses, which would be paid through uh, the budget for 2024, certainly including job posting, staffing, and applicant assessment. Uh, we have a wide variety of um, uh, uh, posting opportunity with uh, integrated platform with Talent Link by virtue of Indeed um, and Glassdoor, where the uh, access to jobs is much more wide range that uh, the outreach is through the biggest platform that exists in the industry and we're seeing some positive results in terms of our recruitment and attraction okay next one the next one aligns with um the next one aligns with the digital wellness platform and falls within the pillar of staff wellness um, the Ministry of Education provided a one tap funding of 50000 to school boards to invest in staff uh, wellness programs. We uh, chose LifeSpeak as a pilot, um, and we've really seen some uh, initial high volume usage uh, by staff for uh, to support their wellness. And since implementing in September, the engagement in this program has continued to grow, and as such, you'll see the reflection of recurring costs of 51000 And that will complete all of my uh, business cases. Right. No questions. So we're going to move on to the next uh, group of of a section of ones that will be focused on capital building. So who will that be? Uh, so, 
Yeah, leadership and capacity. So leadership capacity. Oh yeah. Okay. So we so we kind of you know. Thank you. And through you, Chair uh, McDonald, I have two business cases that I'll present. The first one is on school partnerships. Um, as you know, our department has curated and established some pretty key partners um, this past year and a half. Um, many of you have supported our events, so we appreciate that. We hope to continue to build and secure these long-term sustainable partnerships um, with especially post-secondary and industry partners and businesses. As we know, that's crucial for building future skills and thinking about pathways for the future. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a sense, uh, last year uh, we requested 60,000. We received that. In return, uh, we probably received about close to $3 million in investments from external partners, servicing 1,300 students in 42 schools. So that's a pretty good ROI. <laughs> Uh, when we think of the minimal input, uh, these funds um, really help support some of the admin costs and we do venture uh, with MOUs with our partners and there is some shared uh, cost structures related mainly to transportation because we can't outsource that. Um, and so we cover uh, where we can uh, with some of our partners and that's kind of a respectful mutual benefit um, on your part as well. Um, in all of our uh, partnerships, we do continue to collect data on student achievement um, and have some pretty meaningful um, impacts to share uh, with, with each partner. So we continue to focus on skills when we have exciting new partners this coming year. We just met with Apple Swift Code, so we're looking at um, working alongside um, Bertette Smith, uh, my colleague, who focus on uh, coding. Um, and credentialing and more badging programs. So this cost, um, as mentioned, would be just to kind of oversee overall implementation related to administration costs and student transportation and just, you know, resources and supplies at some of the times. So that's a $65,000 request. So I can take questions or I can move on to the next one. Move on. Move on? All right. So the next one is uh, a proposed program entitled the Peer Support Program. This program has two components. A, the first component is to offer our newly appointed principals with one-on-one -on -one, on-site job shadowing guidance and mentorship for retired principals. I don't think you need to go any further. Okay. I think we understand what that is, right? Then, Good. Okay. Happy okay. Happy. Okay. All right. Want to, uh, Trustee McDonald, do you have a question? Thank you to you, Chair McDonald. Um, on the the uh, business case before that one, the partnerships. No, the student. Yeah, that one. Yes, the partnerships. Yeah. Oh, partnership. Yes. On the student recognition expenses. Um, so, is there currently any? Um, because a long time ago they used to have what they call the stellar awards. Is there anything similar? where you gather students that have achieved, for example, the students that are going to Italy um, or, or these, uh, you know, won some prize with NASA and they've done amazing achievements or getting perfect, let's say, in an international exam, like the Gauss math exam. Do we have any kind of recognition for students like that currently? Uh, so for you, Chair, um, so... Trustee McDonald, I cannot answer those specific student recognition award ceremonies or acknowledgements. I can speak to the partnerships in our department only. And for that, I will share that students, for instance, I can name the top three who completed recently their Grow with Google data analytics. We will be acknowledging them at our celebration and graduation in the fall. Um, we hope to expose them with partnerships. Um, some other recognitions is that as a result of their completion, um, and uh, participation in this program. They have landed Waterloo University acceptance. They have landed summer internship programs. So although the board has not had formal celebrations to acknowledge their efforts, we will continue to look at, at least in our department, how we can recognize the students that have gone through our program. We also know that the Algoma Elite program, Austin, who is our new Indigenous student trustee, would speak, you know, quite confidently about his experience in that program and how that has propelled him to seek leadership opportunities. So um, I 
I totally agree. And the very first uh, people know, but I'd like to kind of celebrate students. So that is something maybe we can take away. Um, and perhaps uh, it's a bigger conversation around how we recognize student achievement in general um, and recognize efforts in various programs across the board. I think that's super important. Yeah, thank you. And because this student recognition does um, relate to your department. Okay, okay. So if you could, I'd appreciate if you could, as you say, take that away and look at, you know, like people who, students that have done excel in sports or went to Oxford and won gold or because they used to have that. And I think- That's not your department. I'm sorry, that's not her department. Yeah. This is later. So yeah. that's, some, that's another group that would be under the curriculum committee you would bring that to. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no other questions on this. We can go to our next. Uh, where are we? Uh, are we safe and caring schools? Yes. yes. We're in safe and caring schools. <laughs> Thank you, Chair <laughs> McDonald. Uh, I am requesting your support to hire five safe and caring schools resource teachers to support the multi year strategic plan around safety and well being, enhance safety, foster a sense of belonging, and support mental health. This year, the current five resource teachers enjoyed incredible success working directly with principals, classroom teachers, and students with a specific focus on student behavior and teacher practice, including progressive discipline and the deep integration of anti-oppressive, anti-racist, and anti-colonial, culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy that addresses the ongoing needs of students and teachers. Uh, resource teachers work directly with students to address their concerns and challenges and inspired previously disengaged students to assume a leadership role in changing the climate of the school. Uh, they also work with the safe and accepting school teams to develop, deepen and monitor their anti-bullying plans, including the need to eliminate racist and homophobic behavior and language within schools and classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been uh, proactive, they're responsive to suit student behavior, but they've also been responsive to site-based issues when a community incident has had a negative impact on the overall school climate. Their work has reassured admin, teachers, okay. students, and parents that all students are cared for and valued, and a sense of belonging has deepened, and their identities and cultural ways of being have been infirmed. So our RTs go beyond the work of the ministry directives and our policy 48. These positions support our system priorities of safe schools and the reduction of concerning student behavior. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Trustee Davis. Let's have a short question, please. Are, are these existing positions that we're just trying to renew for another year, or is this uh, totally new? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Davies. We currently have five resource teachers and one resource teacher for restorative justice um, for a total of six, and I'm asking them uh, five positions to be renewed for next year. So just to clarify, you now have six, but you're going down to five. Correct. We are embedding okay. restorative justice in the work of the remaining five. Thank you. Thank you. So this, a, so this was a year fund last year, and we're, new, we're renewing less this year. Thanks for clarifying that. No, no, question. no questions? Good questions. Okay, just all questions are good. Um, so thank you, uh, Superintendent Stubbings. Uh, we're going to now go on to the next uh, business case. Uh, we're going to be in spec ed and social emotional learning, uh, and that will be um, business case. So we'll start ten fifty four. And who's going to? Uh, yeah, Superintendent uh, Sakato is there. So the floor is yours. And if yes, you can just go through each one briefly and then we'll get through this quickly. Absolutely. Thank you. And through you, Chair McDonald, I do want to share that for all of the six business cases that I'm presenting today, there are very strong and direct links to the multi-year strategic plan. This also aligns with the report shared by a uh, research department earlier today that the areas of focus that we should continue to look at are students with vulnerabilities, mental health and well-being. And it also aligns significantly to the feedback that we've been given by SEAC our, and our partnership with them. So. Um, 
Case 1054 um, is an ask for 125 um, FTE full-time EAs. Um, as you know, and many of you have experienced, uh, the needs for EAs continues to grow in our system. Um, the, the number of students who uh, have disabilities, as well as the complexities of students with disabilities, has significantly increased. And uh, each year, my department goes through student independence forms and determines that the areas of uh, where the areas of needs are. So we're requesting 125 uh, full-time EAs to meet the needs of, of the system. So uh, I'll just interrupt. Uh, sure. Following uh, Thursday Davies' question, uh, these are new EAs. Correct. Yes. Currently, um, we have in our system um, over 2,275 uh, EAs based on the needs. Those are mostly school-based, the majority of school-based, with, of course, some in departments to help with itinerant services, dealing with students with high-risk behavior, um, ASD transition services, and things like that. So we have currently uh, um, about 2,275. Permanent. Thank you. So the next uh, item is 1066, I guess. Great. Right. Ten, yeah, 1066 is a request for an additional uh, two um, social workers in our PSSP. Um, with a particular focus on mental health. As you know, um, many requests for supports from uh, our social workers have increased. They are currently sitting at full caseloads and um, there is a need um, for um, making sure that we have identity specific supports in place for all of our students. Our department's done a very good job at hiring um, students uh, identity specific supports, but we've noticed an increased need for students with autism and, and uh, intellectual disabilities and that they too require supports with mental health and well-being. So we are asking for two FDE social work for the mental health team. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next one, 1078. Yes, um, we are asking for 26 um, Child uh, CYCPs, child and uh, child youth care practitioners. Um, this is um, a, an existing support we have in place now, and we are asking for renewal. Um, CYCPs really are crucially important in the system to provide uh, capacity building and direct intervention in the areas of engagement, equity, identity, exploration, anti-bullying, uh, substance misuse and abuse, mental health literacy and social skills. So they belong in our social emotional learning team and schools make requests to provide support uh, when needed. And we would need these uh, to really shift practice. The goal of the CYCPs is to improve uh, teacher practice and in a, in a trauma-informed, culturally responsive way. Okay, Perfect. next. Next, we have uh, 1080, um, and this is um, an additional request for two school-based social workers. Um, so um, similarly, as I shared, our social work referrals have increased significantly this year. We have currently 55 uh, permanent social workers, but their caseloads are full at the moment, and we want to ensure that all students in schools have access to social work referrals. So we are asking for uh, an additional two into the system to decrease caseloads um, and reduce weight times, especially in our middle and secondary schools where we're seeing an increased need for social work support in our with our students. Great, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, 1082. Um, further to my first request of uh, 1054, 1082 is asking for an additional um, 50 uh, LTO educational assistance. We would like to add um, the LTOs to make sure that um, they're required for supporting students into the mainstream EAs um, uh, that require, uh, sorry, school students who uh, with special needs or complex needs may need additional support. Um, the reason we're asking for LTOs in this case is that we want to make sure that, you know, in the event of, of a reduction of need that we always have the flexibility to not have permanent EAs and we want to be financially responsible, but we already have a need for these additional 50 to be allocated to high risk students um, and other areas of support as uh, shared by many, many schools in the system. Great. Um, we'll move on to 1083. Uh, yes, the um, 
1083 is looking for a psychoeducational consultant in the behavior program department. Um, so currently we have school based psychologists, but we would like a consultant in the um, behavior program because they bring a really deep clinical lens and a uh, and an un deeper understanding of maladaptive behavior that allows us to really interrogate the function of a student's behavior so that when we're providing supports and or recommendations to schools that we truly know why the student is behaving in that way. And their recommendations include um, supports to educators, principals, uh, EAs to make sure that the environment is most conducive to that student and who they are and how they learn. Um, so we would like to add an additional psychoeducational -educa consultant to our social emotional learning team to make sure that students are well supported. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Cicada. So do we have any uh, questions uh, on these items? I see none. We'll now move on. Oh, sorry, I also McDonald's. have there's a uh, hand up. Okay, Trustee McDonald online. Thank you, through you, Chair. I see that this request is a one time. Um, I was just wondering why is it one time and not a permanent? Would, isn't this something that I would imagine we would need permanently? So thank you for the question and through you, Chair McDonald. Um, yes, we want to make sure that the means of which we plan to use a psychoeducational consultant really does build capacity. So we want to make sure we're able to measure the metrics of the support, look at if they're if that their advice uh, that they've given to schools really help to build capacity within the schools and 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 change and change maladaptive behavior in a positive way. So we wanted to make sure that the way that we intend to use them was effective and efficient in supporting students. So we wanted to make sure we had that data to share back. Oh, OK, thank you. OK, so now we can move on. Yes, thank OK, you. we can. Thank you. We can, thank you, uh, Superintendent Sacato. So now we're going to move on to our facilities. And who's going to be presenting our facilities? OK, way in the back there. OK. <laughs> Good evening to you, Chair McConnell. So I've got uh, four business cases here. I'll start with uh, 1096. This is for GPS tracking software. Um, the uh, ask is for to secure funding to support uh, app-based software um, GPS tracking devices for 85 vehicles in our current fleet. This would include a one-time cost to install the devices, as well as technical support, as well as licensing fees annually. The main goal of this ask is to improve efficiency, safety, um, as well as provide real-time uh, monitoring of our vehicles, especially for any emergency call-outs. And if anything gets stolen? That could be also the case, but no, I don't think anyone will be stealing any of our vehicles. <laughs> okay, the next item is 1097. So our next, next ask is uh, for gasoline contracted service. Currently, our gasoline is delivered by our facilities managers uh, primarily. They use their own personal vehicles for the delivery of the gas. Uh, as many of you probably carry gas in your trunks, this has become very onerous and uh, it's uh, quite a, a health and safety and, and can be an insurance issue for the, uh, for, the, for the staff. So the ask is to contract this service out. Um, the estimate is that there will be approximately eight deliveries required uh, for elementary locations, uh, uh, for secondary locations, and four deliveries for um, elementary locations. The current estimated value of this is $135,000 approximately, uh, which is about approximately $100 per delivery with a licensed gasoline delivery vendor. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 1098. 1098 uh, is to cover inflationary increases for supplies and contracted service. As we all know, uh, inflationary costs for supplies, materials, et cetera, have gone up uh, considerably over the last years. Um, our current uh, estimate is that uh, it's approximately 2% annually. Uh, these uh, requests, are, which are four items totaling approximately $524,000, are to cover these inflationary costs for supplies and contract insurance. Uh, so we're supposed to get 2% from the government. Yeah. So should that not be covered by that? So Kurt, currently, uh, we have seen some in, uh, in significant increases in materials, particularly in steel and other type of materials, uh, particularly in the construction industry. Yeah. So that that is the answer. Okay. 
Thank you. Next item 1127. This is to cover our organics recycling program. Um, as Director Swarov has, uh, has mentioned in her, her uh, annual uh, call out, uh, we are trying to uh, reduce overall waste in our schools, uh, especially by trying to keep uh, food and organic waste out of our own clothes. We do have the pilot program currently in place at 20 schools. It has been successful. We have not seen any major issues with the 20 schools. The ask is to continue the program to all schools in view. And the uh, ask is apparently, uh, it's approximately $115,000. This cost would include um, approximately $70,000 for the program, as well as uh, uh, an annual cost, approximately $40,000 for supplies, including liners for containers, et cetera. Thank you. And uh, we're, that would be all for you. So do we have any questions related to these items? Sure. So we're getting down to the last group. We don't have one, sorry. Oh, I have one, sorry. Just uh, two quick questions and you may not have the answer to them. Um, on the installing of the GPS, um, from my experience, you may find out some things that you don't want to find out. Are we going to actually do anything about such instances or it's just, it's just part of the cost of our scale back on on savings. And I just wonder if we had any thoughts towards that. And the second question was, did you have an approximate number on how much the fuel delivery, how much we're paying out in expenses for the fuel delivery right now? So that, that might make that one easier to swallow this one. If so, for okay. the first question, do you chair? So uh, in terms of the GPS, we have um, actually looked at some of this and we've had uh, discussions with our union partners. And we cannot, of course, use the GPS for disciplinary purposes. What we can, of course, use the GPS is to make things more efficient in our fleet. Uh, one of them would, of course, include uh, geofencing, so that if a particular vehicle leaves its designated area and other uh, safe driving habits, the GPS can be used to make sure there isn't excessive idling, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the things we can do with our GPS system. Um, of course, it's real time tracking. There will be a monitoring of the, of the actual vehicles where they are at any particular time. And the software has many other options also, which I probably shouldn't get into, but there are a lot of other options if you look at GPS tracking. So I'm quite familiar with them. Um, in terms of um, the gasoline delivery, um, I would say currently it's been a historical practice for facility managers to deliver the gas. But one of the issues, main issues, is I don't think we have a major expense in terms of mileage because they usually pick up the gas close to the schools and then deliver it. One of the major issues is their own personal insurance carriers, uh, um, often pushing back in regards to them transporting. And it can be large amounts of gas, of course, you know, uh, each facility manager up between 20 to 25 schools to build our gas to. And that's a considerable amount of gas to put in your trunk. Okay. Okay, to trust your option. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tristan Davies asked a question that's on one of my mind. Um, why would we not use the information gathered if it's reasonable for this? Like, again, I'm, I'm thinking of like reckless driving, doubling the speed limit, things like that. So, through you, Chair, for safety reasons, definitely we can do that. Uh, for other reasons, we cannot use the GPS to track our personal. Uh, Trades in East Point. That's the new Good. Now we're going to turn to learning technology support. Um, who do we have presenting uh, Business Gate 1087? Uh, there we go. Yes, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair McDonald, and through you, um, this is uh, 1087 is regards to Smart Find Express. It is replacing the current Easy Connect. It's for attendance and absence management for uh, teachers and staff. It's um, it will result in uh, over $100,000 savings per year, and it's a much better, much more modern system. I love saving money. Thank yeah. you. Uh, next item, 1088. Business case. 1088 is the digital document distribution which distributes IEPs, 
report cards and uh, any documents that need to go to parents and teachers, uh, sorry, and students securely. This was implemented during COVID. We was funded through the COVID funding and it has resulted in savings as well from printing and mailing report cards, which is uh, aligned with the board's sustainability strategy and plans. And currently, since there's no more COVID funding, we would like that to be funded uh, to continue with the system. Thank you, good, uh, love, again, love saving money. Next business case, 1089. 1089 is the upgrade of the current uh, Elite legacy system from LearnStyle that uh, is the IEP writer. And uh, this is what the teachers use to, to write the IEPs and send these IEPs. Um, this is, we'll be replacing uh, this with RISE, which is the new modern system. It will also include a number of additional modules for social and emotional learning and for the spec ed department. Um, and we're only paying the difference since it's provided by the same company. Perfect. OK, so uh, let's go on to the next one. And the last one yep. is uh, with regards to 1090. That is the eBase work order system. This is the system that is used by maintenance staff and uh, facility staff. Uh, there has been increases over the years due to inflation and adding additional modules that uh, facilities and maintenance staff needed. And that is just a difference uh, to address those inflation increases. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Trustee or McDonald? Uh, okay, Trustee. Uh, Mr. McDonald online, please. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, in the previous business case regarding the um, report cards, is by adopting the system, are you um, is the board now totally eradicating um, paper? That's the goal to totally eradicate paper um, report cards. Uh, thank you for your question, Trustee McDonald. Through you, Chair. Um, it has been the case since COVID, uh, Trustee McDonald. So its uh, report cards had not been printed before COVID. They were being printed and mailed physical copies to uh, to parents. Uh, now, currently, they get distributed directly digitally through a secure encrypted mechanism. Now, there is still the ability for on a one-off case, if a, if a parent requires a printout, they can go to the school or request it from the school and they can do it. But uh, for the majority, I would say um, it's all been distributed digitally and it's been very convenient for students and, teach and uh, their parents. And has saved the board uh, money from mailing and paper and printing and aligns with the sustainability strategies of the board as well. Okay. Four pages. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But, 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 saved. but there are people who um, don't have access to printing to get, but you say they can go in. And also, often, invariably, the ones online aren't signed. So that's also problematic. A lot of those online ones are not signed from um, my experience. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And we'll move on to the last one. <laughs> Who's going to do this uh, $3 million? Okay. Good evening, and through you, Chair McDonald. Um, the transportation business case that's in front of you, um, the Student Transportation Appeal Region has a contract with their school bus operators that requires a um, CPI increase within that contract. Prior to COVID, CPI was less than 2%. Um, as you well know, CPI has continued, uh, had, had increased after COVID and is slowly coming down. However, for this year, we require a 3% increase to the overall budget for the home school transportation piece, amounting in uh, 1.2 million approximately. And that also is incorporated with the home or with the summer school transportation piece as well. The uh, bus driver uh, recruitment uh, and retention bonus, we did not receive full funding for that. However, we have now received full funding in the latest GSN, so that money, the 2.1 million, will be part of the grant that we will receive. So there is a grant to Trustee Davies' question for almost every business case. There is grant money to cover that piece. For your business case, and I'm, for every other business yeah. case. <laughs> a lot of business cases. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
So, okay. so can I ask that question? Why, why do we put it on here if it's being funded? Through you, uh, Jim Donald. Uh, yes, it is funded. Uh, we do receive uh, funding, but uh, in, in some cases, uh, the ministry will, will, will assign, say, the funding can only be used for certain items. Other cases, the boards have flexibility. So we wanted to make sure that the, the board has, has uh, is approving what the staff is recommending. I, I think in the future, we should either have a column or an indication that this money is funded. Would be really nice for yeah. trustees. So we go, oh yeah, find it. But the only thing, Chairman uh, Donald, I will add is where it is specifically related to a business. So we'll do that. Right. Other cases, the board has an option. Right. But you know, we've seen Indigenous, uh, and now we see this, yeah. this for example, yeah. and we just be going, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, uh, yeah. in this case, uh, through the chair, yeah. you know, as far as bus driver tension and uh, recruitment and attention, yes, that's the case, but not for other. No, CPI, ministry only provide two percent. I know. So, but, but but we have a commitment because it's part of public right? Understand. Understand, and it's almost like we have to. We have to. So there's another column. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Trustee uh, uh, McDonald online. I see your hands up. Yes, Sang. So just a follow up to what you're saying, because I'm a little confused, because my thinking is if we approve this as is and approve three million four hundred and six thousand five thirty four and they are getting uh, two eighteen, whatever, and then two uh, percent of that three percent. Right. So then we would have allocated this money for that. But they are also going to be getting probably um, in the end, let's say three million dollars. So I, it's almost not double dipping is the word, but if it's the money is coming in, so technically for this business case, then we should be funding sixty eight thousand eight forty nine, and then one percent, like dividing one two one nine four nine two into three, and dividing and, and just funding that part of it, if I'm understanding the response to your question. Because why are we going to be funding uh, 3 million four six if a lot of it is going to be coming in terms of grants? I still don't understand why we do it that way. Yeah. So through you, uh, Chair McDonald, the grants that we see, including the, 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 the transportation, is mm -hmm. only included in our revenues. It's already included as part of our revenues. And these are the ones which they could approve the business cases will be part of our expenditures. And then we need to look at over our revenues and expenditure. Actually, that's the next item that we will share. And that will show us that once we count all of our revenues and without counting the business cases, where we are and what's the bottom line so that we can go through the business cases and then you have the opportunity to say, yeah, yeah, depending on. So that's the reason because the, the way the accounting works uh, means all of them at the end of the day, all of our funding comes, uh, budget comes to the to the funding. If that's the case, then we, so uh, in, in certain cases, I think what we do in the future, if it's particularly for a certain item, we to give that, we will we'll indicate that is there. But others, I think the board will have the option to do either go with that or something else. But appreciate. Does that help, uh, Trustee McDonald? Just a tad. So I'm going to ask a question through you, Chair. So if the trustees, when we are deliberating and trying to figure out how we want to divvy up the pot, if we say for this business case that we'll approve, let's say, um, say 400,000, which would cover summer school transportation plus that 1% of the CPI, let's say roughly it's 400,000. Would that be sufficient to say, okay, we're approving this business case, but we're going to approve it for 400,000, um, 650, uh, 534, knowing that 3 million is going to be coming anyway. We don't have to contribute that 3 million. Would that be okay? So, through your chair, uh, Donald, in this case, this, this, this business case is a little bit unique in the sense that uh, as part of our contract, we have a commitment to the service providers that we have to pay them 3%. And on top of that, uh, 
the, the, the recruitment and retention bonus is also a commitment because ministry is growing as the funding that we now flow, we need to flow that to the bus operators. So in this case, different. the only option in this case where is, is the summer school transportation. That whether we, we go back and ask the transportation uh, stopper to, to come up with efficiency to, to, to provide that. Uh, but other two uh, of items, we have a commitment in a way that as a board, we have to have those expenditures. That's good. I understand that now. I think uh, we have to do one and three. Right. And really, we only decide if only 68,000 yeah. is what we want to find. Understood. Okay. Sorry, I still don't uh, understand it because he he said that we're getting <laughs> funding for that money. So I don't understand. We have to. So 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 item three. Let's start as a simple one. The item three, yeah. we're getting funding. So yes. uh, what we're going to do is we're going to approve that because we got. It's not like we're uh, saying additional. Take it out of some other place. Yeah. We're going to just say yes. Funding's there, and it's just passed through. And so we're not really making a budget change okay. in and out. Uh, and so uh, item two. That's new. We have to come up with sixty-eight thousand dollars that wasn't there last year, and that's where we're making a decision to spend reserves or whatever on. But item one, we're uh, they're giving us two percent, but we have a contract that says three percent, and this is the difference. Does that make sense? Oh, so that one million two is the one percent of the shortfall that we should be. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Good. Good. So uh, those are all our business cases. Uh, we're going to quickly uh, go to uh, run through the rest of this meeting. Uh, oh, no, we don't. Can't. We have one more. We have a uh, summary of the revenue and expenses. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Tanya. Yeah. Or is it uh, to be sure. So um, as typical, we'll do because we've already covered revenue in the uh, previously. We're not going to go into revenue in detail. However, uh, Conqueror, uh, Mr. Central here, will go through the expenses uh, to kind of show where we are currently at our expense before adding any of the business cases. Um, and just as a reminder, what you will see in terms of expenses is sort of like the starting point, meaning that what we, we actually have added, though, would be the collective agreement requirement. So let's like salary increases, which we know of. Uh, but everything else uh, is without the business cases. And this is where it will be eventually the starting point of any additions. And then after Conqueror, I will just uh, provide a summary of the net bottom line. Yeah, it's not here. It's even a secret hat. Please. Uh, do you want? Do you have the document? Or do you want me to? Uh, it's the and we're going to quickly go through this because it's yes. really a summary of what we have. Yes. Having an information sister after this, after we want to do this. So, long night. Probably tell you guys. Five. He doesn't have her? I think she said it. No. She said she sent it to you. What did she send? I sent it to you. No. Just not. I sent it to you. Who sent it first? I sent it. Mm -hmm. I have it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Summary of That's it. Yeah, just send it to okay. you. Okay. Yeah, just for me. Well, that's the one that we got to share. Hmm. Love and every minute. Okay, thank you and for your chair. So this is the summary of operating expense. So you can see on the top far left, we have the first column description. So under this column, what we have is really the different departments of the board. 
And uh, in here, we also have the schools. The schools are all lumped and the regional. The, first, the second column shows the current year's budget. So in, uh, about the same time last year, this was the budget that was approved for the different departments. And uh, the next column is the 24-25 budget. So as Tanya mentioned, no inclusion of any of the business cases that you've seen today, but uh, those uh, expenses have been updated with any change in salary rates. So we talk about the change in uh, salary rates because of collective agreements or the provision that the ministry has asked us to uh, include. And also what we have in those budget uh, expenses for 24-25 or the bill 124 adjustments. So in here, you see all those changes. And uh, the last column is the change. So really just the difference between this year and going into next year. So in that change column, you see a lot of positive numbers and mostly because of this, as uh, we mentioned before, of the salary increases, but also just uh, a reminder about the enrollment. So we talk about the enrollment going down in our previous meeting by 1880. So with the enrollment going down, we found the funding like less uh, staffing funding and less funding. So accordingly, what we have done in the budget for 2425, the adjustments for uh, uh, the declining enrollment has also been made. So that you would see then an offset against the salary increases. So if we look at the change column, like I mentioned, the first one is the regional. The regional, if you see, is $1.5 billion out of the total of $1.9 billion. So it represents 80% of the overall operating expense. So this is where we have most of it, not most, but all our schools and uh, the in the classrooms and outside the classroom type of expenses. So moving on, uh, I'm just going to do the big items. Yeah. So I'm just going to uh, cover the big items. And uh, so the next one, I go the central organization expenses. So in here, we have the expenses that doesn't put into directors or human resources or finance, more like the central admin, like our insurance, the value SIB expenses, that type of uh, expense. So here we've seen uh, more like in terms of the, the WSIB uh, increases and stuff. So we see three and a half million dollars up. The, the next ones we see finance innovation, that's mostly uh, adjustment for enrollment uh, offset by increasing salaries. I'm just gonna uh, jump to equity. So equity, you see a decrease in budget. So that's because uh, uh, two reasons. First reason is because um, if you remember when, sorry, when we approve business cases or when the business cases are approved, there's always this question about, is it one time or is it ongoing? So if they are one time, what we do do is we come from we start the Budget this year will remove all those one-time items. So many of the negative amounts here is because there have been business cases one time that were removed and offset by any salary increase. And there has also been, in some cases, uh, uh, real, meaning that we have combined the departments moving um, some areas from one department to the other. So. The curriculum is a good example. The next one here, you see curriculum, curriculum has been up by seven and a half million. And down below, you see a negative of 7.6 million from elementary. So what we've done is just combine uh, the elementary under the uh, bigger curriculum. Um, so the same uh, idea for leadership capacity building one-time business cases, offset by salary increases, safe school and spec ed also uh, between the business cases one time being removed and some reorganization that has happened, offset by salary increases. Uh, this is the result of the negative uh, changes. And uh, other than that, most of them are just uh, factoring in, as I said, declining enrollment uh, offset by uh, 
salary increases, the public engagement and communications, there has been a movement from the uh, from this department here, from the media group, who have moved uh, to the LTSS department. So that being said, if we look at the overall change, we see that without any business cases that you've seen earlier today, the, the increase in expense is uh, $65 million. Ken, do you have? So if I'm going to do the summary. Uh, do you have a slide? Does he have the slide for that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's up right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go through uh, because what we've been doing so far is really concentrating on the core ed funding, um, and so core ed funding, as you will see on on the slide above, is really just the first line. So I'm just going to kind of just touch on, um, you know, if you. What we covered, what Cawthor was mentioning, is the first line under expenses, and what we covered before is the first line under revenue. So again, the columns work the same. We have the 23, 24, 24, 25, and the change. Um, so last uh, meeting, we talked about the Corey Ed operating grants, and our grants for this year are 1.835. Uh, as Cawthor just mentioned now, operating expenses are 1.918. So it doesn't look very good. Uh, so that there, that's a delta of about 82 million. So I, I just to speak to I mean a lot there's a lot of lines I'm only going to focus on the one that kind of when I say make a difference are the ones that don't net out because there's a lot of things that uh for example like our responsive education program we get the funding but you'll see the exact amount in expenses that kind of net out because it's one of those uh what we mentioned before we get a very specific grant and um, we have to spend it exactly for that or its return. So there's a few areas that are similar, including our, let's, let's say, school-generated funds. Whatever the schools collect um, ha has to be then uh, spent uh, at, with, for the students. So, so I'm not going to really talk a lot about the ones that are kind of in and out, but I am going to try and explain uh, how we kind of shrink the $82 million delta. You will notice that uh, in the revenue, there is a line called... Um, uh, um, miscellaneous revenue. And so miscellaneous revenue are revenues that help contribute uh, to uh, our overall revenue. If you remember the presentation we did, we, I said core ed is about you know 97% of our revenue, and then we have uh, a couple of percent uh, in one, one of them being within other, uh, miscellaneous and the other being PPF. So in this case, other revenue, the miscellaneous was 21.5 million. Um, and things in here would be our international students, um, and you can uh, then also you can see that it's increased year over year about 2.8. So international students have contributed to that increase. Additionally, we are now um, doing more with our uh, rentals. So that has, again, helped bump up the revenue there. So that's uh, helping us. Uh, other things in here um, that are ongoing, although haven't changed much, are the interest that we would make by holding funds for a period of time when we get the, the flow. Um, and we've talked again before about our sub solar revenue. So those are the biggest components within our miscellaneous revenue. Um, and then, as you notice, it has gone up a little bit. Um, the other thing that contributes to, um, the, if you go kind of just past the expenses, because uh, I don't cover all that, you will see, yeah, this is good right there, uh, you can see deferred revenue. As mentioned before uh, in, in the presentation, the ministry uh, in the past has had a lot of different envelopes. And again, if we were using it, we have to defer it and we could only use it in a year. Uh, this year, uh, they are pushing um, school boards to use the deferred revenue, and they're doing that by um, removing some of the restrictions of, of how tight the envelopes are so you can use a foot broader um, and so now uh, this year we are uh, sort of being pushed to use about 7.4 so that's helping us again shrink the differential and that's the intent I think that's why the ministry has done that is so that uh, boards are not holding funds and, and potentially being in a deficit um, the other line there, receivable bill 124, I think Cawthor mentioned, uh, again, from the perspective, if you look at the regional line, uh, we were like 64, 60 million over, and uh, there's bill 124 increases in there, uh, and, and bill 124, uh, even though we're, we're paying it out, uh, they haven't yet adjusted our revenue for 24-25. Bill 124 had just been settled. We're going to be paying it out this week, and that's over five years. Uh, and, but the increase was, uh, I believe it was uh, one point, uh, in the last year was 2.75. It's 1.25 uh, 
five and five and then uh, yeah. So in in the end, uh, although we've paid everybody, what happens for 24-25, the ministry hasn't changed the calculations of their formula. So they've said we haven't changed the calculations because this happened so late in the process. But uh, we will, you know, consider a receivable because obviously we owe you money if you're being asked to pay eight people, um, and they and we made an estimate. So again, this is not baked into the formula, so it's not coming through the grant line because they're not giving it to us in that way. And they said they will adjust that. So we've estimated based on the monies they flowed for the retro payments that it's about sixty million dollars. So again, that helps to close that. That's the majority of the gap. As we mentioned, the majority of our increases are salary increases, and, and this is the ministry acknowledging that they will be increasing that. Um, and then the compliance measures below are things that the ministry at, that we need to kind of consider uh, for compliance purposes. So when you know, if we look at where we stop after the 60 million, it looks like we have a 7.2 million dollar surplus at the moment. However, there are things the ministry says that we have to take account of that brings that down. One of those items, as always, is, is in your revenue for land. So the way, you know, right. when we collect EDC revenues, they expect us that to be held, that we cannot use that for anything else. And so even though the EDC revenue is within the revenue in totality, we have to back it out. Uh, we, we can, though, um, net it off with any interest that we incur, which we do. Um, but otherwise, we have to kind of keep it whole and hold it for future land purchases. Uh, similar, I mean, there's some other things that we have to do from, from that perspective. Uh, and so when we make all those what we call compliance adjustments, uh, what the ministry would consider where we land in terms of compliance surplus or deficit would be uh, a small sur uh, surplus right now of $4.9 uh, million. So if I heard, so 4.9 million, we have a surplus, which we had, we were down 27 million last year, which we had to pull into our reserves to even balance our budget. And then we use more reserves to fund business cases. So how does this relate now to business cases? Uh, because we're now after this going to go through the business cases. And before we had, oh, you had this kind of amount of money in business cases. We didn't have a, a surplus. How much can we? How much do we have to spend? There? So I, I will just uh, my first, and then um, oh. Associate Director Bigelow can comment. Um, so just for clarity, uh, within these numbers, um, obviously there are business cases, uh, but all the revenues are are reflected, right? So what I mean by that, in some instances, like for the example transportation, all the transportation grant would be within the total. So any business cases that are approved would be additive to the expenses that you see here. Correct. So then, um, in terms of reserves, I don't know if you want to comment. Thank you. So, um, if we just look at overall summary, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so through you, uh, General Donald, if we look at overall summary, uh, before we consider any business cases, we have currently have a surplus of just over four point nine million dollars. Right, that's what we have. And then if you look at the business cases, they total around $22.5 million. Yes. So we do have, uh, as we talked about it, uh, indigenous uh, grant we have. So that can be used because we have put it into our expenses as a grant as well, already done that. So that means if, if those cases are approved, that does not add to the body money. Correct. So when I looked at it, we just have $100 million down. So if you take the million dollars, so you're left with a business case around $21.5 million. Yeah. And we only have 4.9. But what about the 3 million or sorry, yeah, the, the, the transportation part? Oh, yeah. No, that that because we have released all into the revenue. So it will add to that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we have 21 million. We have business cases of $21.5 million. And where we stand is we can only have a surplus of 4.9. So well, that means we, uh, so uh, we've if, subtracted the two if, for its $17 million of, yeah. and uh, if we fund them, they, uh, they have to come from this. Up. And so normally it comes from sur uh, surpluses. Do we have $17 million in surpluses to fund that? Yes, we do have a, so I would like to can have that conversation and then you can sit in the business. Okay, case. we'll have that conversation in business cases. Okay, so. Um, 
can can that question go in the discussion later in the business case uh, conversation? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we're going to go quickly to uh, yes. I yes. have a question. I have yes. a question again around the um, the transportation revenue. So yep. um, just listen to your exchange there. Um, A.D. Gill said that the revenue for tra transportation was put in revenue. So he still it needs to be approved in the business case. So why is it, for example, then that Bill 124 didn't come as a business case or even like under revenue, um, you know, uh, capitally related revenues? Because it's um, like you're getting money for that. So they, they don't need... I thought the business case in all these years of doing this, that it, these we are funding items that's not like our regular day-to-day -day expenses. So I, if the transportation, we're getting money for the payout, for the incentives, why is that a business case? I still don't understand. Because why aren't we then saying all teachers' salaries should be a business case? Because it's in our revenue. I, I really find this transportation thing puzzling. So uh, to you, uh, Chair McDonald, these business cases were entered by staff in, in March. We asked yeah. them because the process starts in, in February. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the confirmation of, of transportation funding that we were getting, we got it close to uh, in almost end of April or April. April. So that's part of sometimes it's the challenge it is, is is that what we will get in, in funding from the ministry or what we want? So, so, so that's why that's part of the reason it's 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 sometimes there. But I think going forward, uh, we what we'll look at it is if there is a committed funding from the ministry for a certain particular, for example, in this case, uh, for the transportation for R and R, uh, we will uh, we will uh, ask the department to revise the budget in, in, in future cases so that it may not come uh, that way. But that's the only one case. In this case, all of the business cases are one where we have that type of situation. But what we have done for now is, and we have included all of the funding we are getting in, in transportation into our other games. So that's why it still has to show as an expense. If we would have taken that out of the business case, then we would have reduced our revenue. Right. So it's, it's, it's in and out. Okay. So I answer your question there, Trustee McCall? Not really, but it's okay. We can hash it out in when we are meeting. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have this question on there? Uh, it's a clarification just about this. It's quick. Yep, yep. Apologize to my colleagues for the, I'll be quick. Uh, uh, through you, Chair. I'm just looking, I'm reading the bottom half of the graph, the summary of operating expenses. I know we briefly covered, I know we said something about, oh, this has been amalgamated to a different section. Just two that I wanted to look at really quickly. The one that's listed as zero dollars for this year, seven million as a shortfall. Elementary curriculum instruction and assessment community, excuse me, community engagement. I'm guessing that what would be spent there is being picked up in a different area. Uh, to you, Chair. So I believe you're 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 talking about the expenses which are departmental. So there was a reorganization where the curriculum department was secondary and elementary at one point, and so now it's been amalgamated into back into just a curriculum, right? Got so it. which covers both elementary and secondary. So I think that's a big change, and and the delta is pretty much the same between the two. Okay. And then my my only other question was for respected social emotional learning well being. It's a shortfall of almost one point two million. Is that just enrollment? Like, did we lose 1.2? Did the ministry not give us that 1.2? How much of that is based on enrollment? Like, were we cut by the ministry? So through you, Chair, so the page that you're referencing is, that is actually the expenses. So these yeah. would be the departmental expenses, right? So so again... Oh, understood. So we're less... We're... Okay. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, okay, so the, the revenue is is the second page. Like if you look at your right. package, the first is summary that is revenue, but the one that was covered it was expensive. I think the one you reference is is expensive. And remember, when we get our two hundred page yeah. uh, budget book, it yeah. will be in there everything that's been changed. Piece of over so many yes. Thank you. This is really the course, you know, course column of the whole thing. Um, so uh, with that, can I have mm -hmm. someone? Sorry, focus on? excuse me, chair. Okay. Hello. Yes. Sorry, I had I had another question for. Um, Cawthrow when she was speaking um, on her the slide uh, before Tanya started talking mm -hmm. um, on 
and not that page, the other, another page. I don't know if they can pull it up on the screen. Page two or three. Right, right. Yeah, this one, this one. Yeah, where it says um, human resources, partnerships and equity. So I noticed that it has gone down um, by almost um, like significantly. Is so under equity, how many equity? Hello, oh, I lost it. I didn't um, see it. Uh, through you, Chair, um, are, are you talking about the equity indigenous education or oh, the slide that you're on before? I just saw it. The, what was up before? Um, uh, um, down. Yeah, resources right here under um. Uh, right there, human resources, partnerships, and equity. Uh, Tweet, that's actually going up by about uh, 900,000. Is that what you look at? It's, so the, the furthest column is prior year. The 14 million is, is the 24 25. So what you're seeing is a potential uh, right now, $908,000 uh, increase. And most of our increases are really related to salary uh, increases. So, because again, most of the departmental costs are uh, people within uh, human resources. Oh, okay. So the column, okay, I thought of it. Could I see the top of that slide? Please. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, you, you. Oh, the the years. Years. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, got, I thought it was the other way around. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're going to quickly uh, uh, so put this on the floor. Uh, Trustee Benjamin, uh, Trustee uh, uh, Bailey, all those in uh, passing the receipt of this oral report. Uh, so passed. Did I do? Did I do the oral report on the previous one? Did I do that? Okay, put that on the floor. Uh, Trustee uh, Joe Hall, seconded by Trustee Bailey. All those in receipt of uh, six point two. The uh, business case. Uh, up. Uh, so passed. Uh, we have no communication, no trustee motions, no trustee notice of motion. So I have someone want to put it on the uh, floor for adjournment for the meeting. Trustee McDonald's online uh, and Trustee Benjamin, a second all those in uh, favor of adjournment. So carried.